If you want to be successful in life, it really will come down to the rules that you play by. For most people, society hands us a set of rules and we just accept them. That works fine in periods of stability and prosperity, but it becomes disastrous in moments like this, which are marked by rapid change and uncertainty. Even if America is the current collapsing Roman Empire, a new set of rules would allow us to navigate both the dangers and the opportunities. To that end, I bring you Constantin Kisson. The West has become very uncomfortable with the idea of power. Exercising power, exercising force, exercising authority. And when you have a culture that is unwilling to use power and force to assert its interests and protect them, the heroic masculinity on the borders will inevitably start to come to the fore. And they will start to try things. Just try. Uh, and we have seen over the last couple of decades that process going on, I think. Um, and <clears throat> I've been talking to a lot of people in the last few days, kind of liberal people. I think a lot of people are starting to think in political terms, and I don't want to make this political, but I think it's, a, it's an important uh, reference point, that while Donald Trump was obnoxious as a person, his approach to geopolitics worked better than the approach that we were taking before and we're taking now. And that is a fundamental understanding that the world operates on power and strength. Mm. Uh, people fear the strong and despise the weak. Uh, there's a quote that the strong will do as they will and the weak will suffer as they must. I've always hated that. That's mm -hmm. always been a gut punch to what I want to be true. <clears throat> um, but nonetheless, as I as I think about, okay, why would it be that in the late stages of an empire, and, and to give people context, so Ray Dalio, who um, I look at as somebody who thinks about the economy a fair amount, I look at Ray Dalio as the um, the economic equivalent of the doomsday clock that tells us how close to nuclear annihilation we might be. And Dalio has been talking about the, um, the percentage chance of civil war in the US. He's been talking about the percentage chance of a global war, another world war. And he gave uh, the odds that we would be in a world war when he wrote his book this is about eight months ago at 35% chance. Recently, literally, like in the last week, he upped that to a 50% chance of a world war. I am very eager to get him back on the show because as of today, um, it, if I can believe what I have read on X, which is always a question mark, but if I can believe what I read on X recently, uh, literally this morning, China has now taken a stance on the Israel-Palestine situation that could very much be read as a stance against the US. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it really does become a question of, okay, in a moment like this, if we really are moving in the wrong direction and Ray Dalio pegs us at phase five and a half of a six phase cycle where phase six is total collapse, uh, of an empire, if we really are that far down and things are trending in the wrong direction as more forces sort of amass against this, the question becomes how much of this is predictable? According to Ray Dalio, a lot of this is predictable. And then what do those movements look like? What What is it about, <clears throat> like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, bring together my question around gender and why that we would see that throughout history and then uh, this potential march towards world war for me this is the picking apart of structure and the reason i wanted to talk to you about it you have said in the past uh we have pulled a lot of the threads that hold the sweater together and so when i look at gender i think that this goes back to what you're talking about with luxury beliefs when people are not under threat they are able to begin to to push back on a lot of the elements of structure that repress them. So structure is by its nature a limiting force. Mm -hmm. And so I think as things get better, we will always as humans, I certainly don't exempt myself from mm -hmm. this, we will always as humans wanna push against the things that limit us. Mm -hmm. Certainly in my own life, as I have gotten more money, the thing that's been hard is to stay disciplined and focused on what works in a business because I can paper over any poor decisions just personally. And so it really did, the first couple of years of impact theory, I, I was wiling pretty hard. And so we had to go, wait a second, like what actually works, use profitability, even though we can build unprofitably, let's really look at that. And so if 
in success of a society, you know it leads to the, um, I'll quote Adams. This is a paraphrase, I want to get very close. Can you tell me how success does not lead to luxury and how luxury can avoid leading to the effeminization of culture, basically, and how at that point, everything begins to break down. And that's what I feel like he was looking back at history, obviously, and seeing the cycle repeat, which is exactly what we're living through right now. We push against the structures. We begin to pick at those things that limit us. And the ultimate thing to pick at that limits us is the 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 core biological construct of male and female mm -hmm. and i actually get why people don't want to be limited you get people then amassing at the edges that are going to test the veracity of those beliefs in the real world and that is what's happening uh and i don't know if you've been paying attention but vladimir putin xi jinping the leader of iran and other leaders around the world there is this phrase that's been doing the rounds from all of these people, which is a multipolar world. They keep talking about it. What is a multipolar world? The multipolar world is the opposite of the unipolar world, which is where we have been since World War II, in which America, yes, you had the standoff with the Soviet Union that ended in 1989 or 1991, depending on whether you count the Berlin Wall or the collapse of the Soviet Union, at which point America became completely hegemonic in the world. And what is happening now is Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, and others, with the support of a lot of people in the West who are like, oh, America's evil, American imperialism, blah, blah, blah. Um, they are now tearing down the world order that we've been living under. And uh, this is what it looks like. Conflict here, war here, civil war there, etc. And uh, I believe that we are living through the very beginning of what will be extraordinarily interesting times, uh, so to speak, unfortunately. Thomas Sowell, who we both love. I mean, he talked about all of this. This is a fundamental, con the conflict of vision that he described uh, is, is the tension between um, the kind of you blank slatism, the belief that anything is flexible, anything can be changed, and the power of feelings, emotions, etc., over the idea that the best way to understand how we ought to live our lives is to look at the past and look how human beings have always lived their lives and what has worked and what hasn't. And when it comes to war and conflict, there's a, a phrase in Latin that has been known for millennia, civis pacem parabellum. If you want peace, prepare for war. If you want peace, you have to be strong. If you want peace, you have to be confident in your own values. This is why last time we spoke for three hours about woke culture. And I've been saying from day one, from the day that I turned down a contract from a, a college not to perform a comedy gig, I said from day one, what this is doing, it is undermining our confidence in our civilization. The fact that in Britain, for example, we have an endless conversation about slavery, and it's a negative conversation, it's a self-flagellating conversation, which is of course understandable given that slavery was an awful thing. The slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade was an awful thing. What people don't know, and I kind of know this, A, because I haven't been guilted into not knowing it, and B, because they actually teach history in the place that I came from, is that the British Empire was the first empire in history to end slavery. Mm. So, we, and I talked about this in, in an immigrant's love letter to the West, which I know you've read. It's like, imagine that 10 years from now, we all become vegan because we recognize that slaughtering animals is immoral. And... Then we say, well, America ended the meat trade first, and that is why they're bad. That wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, that wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. And it's so what I see whenever these conversations pop up and, um, you know, you see at the moment many protests around Western countries, around Israel and Palestine. Most people who are protesting on either side, but particularly on the side of, on the pro-Palestinian side, they have no idea what's going on. They have no idea where Palestine is. They haven't read the history. They don't know anything about it. But what they do know is which side America is on. And so their support for Palestine primarily is an anti-American based idea or an anti-Western based idea. So we have educated generations of our own citizens to hate their own country, uh, to hate their own civilization, to hate the values of their own civilization. Uh, and pulling apart at the threads of that sweater is what's going on. And you're right, one of the things that creates the core of a society, it's 
the interlocking of men and women, right? In families and the reproductive process. There's no getting away from that. You need people in order to be strong economically, militarily, and in every other way. Uh, the fact that we increasingly live in societies, it's less the case here in America, but it's still the case here, where the birth rate is plummeting, as you know. Most Western countries are below replacement rate. In the UK, you're not quite there thankfully here in the US but in the UK we have these ex um, Extinction Rebellion lunatics running around. Uh, Extinction Rebellion are an environmental organization uh, that is linked with another organization called Just Stop Oil and what these people do is they go around saying we should never use any oil again uh, and they glue themselves to roads to stop traffic mm -hmm. uh, using glue made of oil. Uh, that, okay. That's how smart these people are. And one of the things that these people have indoctrinated people to believe is that having children is bad. The greatest environmental impact you can possibly make on the world is to have a child. This is a death cult. It's a, it's a religion of self. It's a religion of suicide that what we are living through in the West. Uh, it's a religion that seeks to undermine every single thing that has made the West successful. We talked about it this last time, and that is what we're seeing. It, we're seeing a civilization that has lost confidence in itself. Uh, and is therefore unable to defend or assert its values internally, let alone project them elsewhere. Mm. Yeah, the one, I think that we should probably define power mm -hmm. because as one of the things I wanna do today, I am very curious to hear your ideas on like, because what I care about is um, personal power, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. It's what my whole impact theory is about that. Like how do you empower people to make um, their lives better. And I've been able to sneak in uh, an obsession over power by calling it empowerment, mm -hmm. uh, which has wonderfully, I think, opened people up to the idea because it doesn't have the baggage of power, but that's really all you're talking about. Um, I have a very clear definition of what I think power is, but I would love to hear yours. Tell me yours. Okay, show me so, yours, I'll show you mine. Ah, fair, all right, <laughs> here we go. Uh, so power is, uh, close your eyes, imagine a world better than this one, open your eyes, go acquire the skills and deploy them to actually make that better world come into existence. And once people understand that ideas are, ideas are only as useful as they can be implemented to move you towards your goals. The problem is most people do not have a clear sense of what their goal is. Mm. Therefore, they have no idea if the things that they're believing are actually moving them towards their goals or not. Um, and then what ends up happening when you don't have those clear definitions is people get caught up in ideas that sound good. We definitely spent a lot of time last time talking about it, um, <clears> but <throat> I, I think it bears repeating for people that haven't seen it. Thomas Sowell has a quote that really steers my thinking in so many things, which is the last 30 years, I usually say 50 because he said it 20 years ago, the last 50 years have been marked by exchanging what worked for what sounds good. And I, power is about the ability to predict the outcome of your actions. Mm. And so if you're trying to do something and that something is honorable, then having the power to see it through is incredibly important. And so being able to acquire skills and deploy those skills in service of something honorable to me is, is the definition of power. Mm -hmm. uh, fine. Uh, no, no quibble with that on a personal level. I think when we talk about internationally and geopolitically, uh, power has a different set of definitions, which to me, when I talk about power, what I mean is the ability for the United States and its allies to achieve their objectives around the world. And those objectives typically are uh, secure uh, the alliance or compliance of various states for the end goal of securing maximum resources for the citizens of our countries uh, and stability, peace, security, etc. Right. So maximum security uh, for ourselves from being attacked, from being invaded, from having our interests challenged and maximum resources. I mean, the, uh, the, the great unsayable is, and, and Vladimir Putin, who I'm a fierce critic of, as you know, uh, he actually said this, you know, America collects a hegemon's tax. Uh, what does that mean? What that means is the average American con consumes five times as many resources as the average citizen of the world. And that is because you're the dominant superpower in the world. Right? We don't like to say it like this because it sounds selfish and greedy and whatever, but fundamentally every society, every country is seeking to maximize the welfare of the citizens in an ideal world. Mm. And the, the art of geopolitics is for these big powerful countries to secure the interests of their people as best they can. 
So from the purpose, from the point of view of the United States, having the richest and safest citizens in the world is what this is all about. And it's been my view for a long time that <clears throat> people have fundamentally misunderstood the people who complain about American imperialism and they're right to because, you know, the, the war in Iraq was a crime and it was a disaster. But on the other hand, that does not mean that America's involvement in, in the rest of the world is not precisely why Americans are as comfortable and as wealthy and as safe as they are and have been for a long time. So, uh, but a lot of people don't understand that. They don't understand that. They, they see America as a source of evil uh, and operate on that basis. <laughs> okay, so I would posit that we share that what you just demonstrated is is the exact um, is a concrete example of the exact definition of power that I gave. Mm -hmm. And it draws us into what I think will ultimately make people very squeamish. Mm -hmm. But what I want <laughs> people to begin to dissect, because again, my goal is to get people to understand their their individual power and that they hard times, bad times, good times, whatever times there are opportunities and dangers. Mm -hmm. You can capitalize on the opportunities and avoid the dangers if you understand the playing field, the chessboard, however you want to think about it. And so the thing that's going to make people squeamish is that what when you as America say, close my eyes and imagine a world better than this one that's where people start to get uncomfortable mm -hmm. about what they imagine is the better world and are marching towards that. So the thing hiding in plain sight with my definition is we're not going to agree what's honorable. And so, but what I don't want people to do is have a reactionary pushback against, okay, power is making a world come true that I don't think is honorable and therefore power is bad. Mm -hmm. No, which is where we are. Correct. And this is why I think that what ends up happening is you one day the lion shows up on your door and now you have a real problem because you're weak and the lion is strong and the lion will do as it will and you will suffer as you must. I would modify that metaphor even more. The lion is walking through the neighborhood looking for the weakest person. Mm -hmm. And if you live in the biggest house and you send out signals of weakness, time and time and time and time again, the lion will be at your door. And that is what's happened. Every time the West sends out a signal of weakness, division, a lack of willingness to assert itself, every time you have a new story about how, you know, in, in the UK, there's a story about how the Royal Air Force decided they were not gonna hire any more useless white pilots and actually discriminated against white men for that job. Now, does that make our military better or worse? Right. We have, we have substituted competence for other things. When you do that, what happens is competence goes down. Whatever you optimize for is what you get, other things suffer, and that's where we are. So we have sent out signals of weakness in terms of our military. We have sent signals of weakness in terms of how divided we are. We have allowed uh, our colleges and schools to indoctrinate our own children with ideologies and worldviews that are fundamentally antithetical to what has made the West successful. And if I'm Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping or whoever else, and I'm looking at that, I'm thinking America has lost its will. America has lost its... And, and, and the last time the United States uh, had a leader who, for all his many personal flaws and lots of things that I disagree with that he did, the last time that they had a leader who was strong, progress was made in the Middle East. The Abraham Accords, uh, Iran wasn't getting the soft deals that it's now getting. Um, and what did they do? They were outraged by his brash personality. They were outraged by his willingness to be strong. They were outraged by him talking plainly about how the world actually works because they live in this imaginary reality in which it's all about your feelings and your emotions and all of that. Um, so uh, this is the point I've made from day one. We don't operate in a vacuum. And if you're uncomfortable with the dishonorable American imperialism, the only thing that I invite you to do is to think about how the world would look if it wasn't America that was doing the imperializing. If it was Russia or if it was China or if it was Iran, is that a better world? Because you don't get to choose the perfect honorable world of your design, I'm afraid. You don't. You get to choose 
as I've said in, in previous podcasts, which ass assholes you're being ruled by. That's what you get to choose. And frankly, Americans are my favorite assholes in that respect. Yeah, so I really hate the messy reality of life, mm -hmm. but um, being in the marketplace as an entrepreneur, you are constantly confronted with some things work and some things don't, and work is defined by what are you trying to achieve. And so it really does force a level of clarity. You, in the last episode, I was rewatching it, <laughs> and you kept saying you're emotionally detached in a way that most people aren't. You're emotionally detached in a way that most people aren't. Uh, and I never said, it didn't occur to me to say it. it's not like I was keeping it to myself, but as I was rewatching it, I, I didn't understand why I didn't say, but shouldn't people be like, to me, the thing that I want to get people to do is focus obsessively on what works, Yeah. what works. You need to know where you're trying to go and you need to know what works. Um, so we get to choose the assholes that are going to rule us. But I, my take on things would be a little bit different. I would say that's probably the, the, like, just unadorned truth of it all and maybe i'm dealing in the the realm of uh the the you wanted to make explained. it you want to make it sound nicer and i don't it's not that i want to make it sound nicer i may just be stuck in a layer of abstraction so okay. i will say what i think um is we do get to choose which is maybe slightly more than that so i think a society gets to decide where it wants to go and every generation is going to decide where they are going to steer things. And so I've thought a lot about this as the young generation comes up and they're taking what I will call self-destructive beliefs, you called suicidal beliefs. Um, I, I'm like, they get to do that. We can't, there's basically nothing that we can do to stop them. Like even if we, right now, we're really dragging in our, or my parents' generation is really dragging it out, staying in political power for as long as they have, but they will die. And so then ultimately the next generation is going to get to control where we go. So everybody gets to take the world where they want to take it. The problem is I don't think people have clear foresight into where exactly, what the second and third order consequences of those decisions are. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that I always use is the, some people need to be chased by a lion. Mm -hmm. What I worry about is if we don't get a comfortable relationship with power, with personal power, with holding myself accountable, because I, I say this to the people in the comments, remember, I come at everything from what can I do? What's my responsibility? What do I need to own? Um, I'm not the guy to talk to for like, what should the, the en masse collection of people be doing? I'll let other smarter people deal with that. I just think about what should the individual be doing? Because I know I can control what I do. I can control the rules and rules of thumb that I abide by which is ultimately the thing I wanna pull people's attention to. It's mm -hmm. where I spend all of my time thinking about what would be the rules and rules of thumb in my own life that are gonna lead me mm -hmm. to where I wanna go, which I define as human flourishing. Okay, so if every generation gets to decide where they wanna go, if we do that partly uh, by electing the assholes that we wanna rule us, what I want people to understand is there's a second layer to that, which is we get to decide what cultural values we champion. And so to do that, I, I would encourage people to take a historical view. Mm. If you wanna get rich, take a historical view, man. Understand the macroeconomics and how they just repeat. <laughs> it is a terrifying cycle. Again, I talk about Ray Dalio all the time. I will just point people to Ray. He covers this so, so brilliantly. Uh, you want to be, um, you want a good uh, governmental structure. Look at history. Like there's so much to learn, oh my God. Just by looking at the, the movements of history culturally. If you wanna look at um, the individual human thriving, look at history. Like there are so many lessons to get by looking at history, but you also have to know where you wanna end up. So you're looking at history as a way to map a better path to the thing, the better world that you can imagine in the future. And so if the way that we convey these ideas such that they become the emotional drivers because I don't think there's any way at the populist level to get people to do anything other than to make it feel right. Mm. And the way that your feelings are shaped, never said this out loud, but this is so important. The way your feelings are shaped are through your beliefs and your values. Most of the time, society just hands us those as a set of rules, effectively, and nobody ever challenges them. So you have to consciously construct your beliefs and your values. That will give you an emotional reaction to uh, the set of rules that you're going to abide by, the structure that you force upon society, the things that you tell people to do and not to do. Okay, so if we take all of that, then people really have to get honest about the second and third order consequences of if I do this thing. Because right now, 
Remember, individuals, I'm talking to you. Right now, people are steering by a, I don't want any constraints. I don't want any confines. Um, the miracle is redistribution, not the creation of prosperity itself. If you do that, the value that you are propagating is that the group should take care of the individual. By the way, they do that by taking from the individuals to give to the group. I would say that the only effective way forward is for the individual to take responsibility, not just of the assholes that they elect, but to take responsibility of the value systems that they propagate because it will completely influence the emotional reaction of themselves and others. And you want to feel really good when you propagate things that lead to human flourishing, which I will say is when you celebrate the individual. Ah, celebrates the wrong word. When you hold the individual accountable. You can reboot your life, your health, even your career, anything you want. All you need is discipline. I can teach you the tactics that I learned while growing a billion dollar business that will allow you to see your goals through. Whether you want better health, stronger relationships, a more successful career, any of that is possible with the Mindset and Business programs in Impact Theory University. Join the thousands of students who have already accomplished amazing things. Tap now for a free trial and get started today. I wanna start breaking down what exactly are the beliefs that trip people up. So we know that uh, focusing on gender is, is a side effect, because I don't even have beef with that, but it's a side effect of wanting to get rid of all structure. Mm -hmm. But there's a set of ideas that I think are probably more complex than just that, that end up taking a person down a road of this all sounds good, but it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Have you thought much about what that stack of beliefs is? Yeah, people like to describe it in different ways. Some people call it postmodernism. Some people call it all sorts of other things. But the very basic thing at, at the core of that is that uh, th there is no such thing as reality. There is only power. And language is how power is exercised and how reality is constructed. Um, the, you know, people always talk about Michel Foucault and, and the idea that this is where this comes from. Uh, so if that if those assumptions are true, then nothing is true and everything is constructed. So if I say I am a woman, I am a woman. If I say I am a different race, I'm a different race. Uh, and this magical world in which we've been encouraged to live in which you can identify as whatever you want. It works very well as long as there aren't anybody any as long as there are not other countries and other forces outside of our world who don't believe these airy fairy uh, falsehoods. But at the core of that system is essentially the belief that reality doesn't exist and it is defined by the way we speak. And that is essentially all there is to power and to structure and to society. I'm sure I'm just at the tip of the iceberg. That is absolutely one of the things that I put, which is everything is a social construct. Mm -hmm. Nature has no rules. There's no ground truth. Um, why does that become so deranging? You said it works as long as there are no other powerful forces. What is it that acting as if you believe that or actually believing it, why does that become problematic? Because it clashes with reality. If, for example, you add you you say there's no difference between men and women uh, and therefore I'm a woman well that has an impact on masculinity femininity it has an in, in impact on how we structure our society what kind of energy our society has in terms of its posture around the world etc so if you take some recent examples um, during the football World Cup uh, the soccer World Cup, which happened in Qatar. I'm married to a Brit. I was <laughs> with you. Uh, which happened in Qatar. All the Western nations spend the entire time talking about LGBTQI+, plus, etc. The reality is no one in Qatar gives a shit about LGBTQI+. Plus, and Western language talking is not going to in any way change how they treat that issue. Because the way they treat that issue is a product of the beliefs they have about the world and about reality and so on. Chastising nations around the world about their values does not change their values. 
but we believe it does because in our countries chastising people over what they say or what they think we think works we think that if we chastise people for their attitudes to various issues they're going to change their mind but it isn't true likewise it isn't true that everybody in the world uh, responds to language uh, I, George Kennan who was a student um, of the Soviet Union and he was an ambassador there for a long time he said that Russia is uh, high uh, is uh, I'm gonna butcher the quote here I can't remember the exact words but it's something like Russia is insensitive to the language of words and highly sensitive to the language of power or language of force mm. right uh, most people out there in the world do not care about being perceived to be moral or being perceived to be virtuous or being perceived to be anything they care about some very simple things like money oil precious metals rare earth metals land force power military capacity right? this is what they care about and to the extent that they are able to achieve that they will pursue that by any means necessary you see this with what Russia is doing, you see this with what other countries are doing. Um, they are pursuing their interests as they understand them by any means necessary. And if we cut off our ability to do the same because we go, oh, this is dishonorable. It's dishonorable to use force. It's dishonorable to have regions of the world under our power, under our influence. Why should we be involved in this country far, far away? Well, the reason is that's how you make America prosperous and safe. Right. But nobody wants to say that because in the world that we live in, it's dishonorable. It doesn't sound good. Right. The truth is, you know, I remember in, I said this on Twitter recently in 1990, in, in the 90s and the noughties, you had all these American movies in which some CIA guy would be like, and they hate us because we have freedom. And I was like, no, idiot. They hate you because you have power. That's why they hate you. People don't want to hear this, but on 9-11 most of the world cheered it wasn't because they hate your freedom it's not because most of the world is jihadi terrorists people don't like the people at the top of the pyramid everybody wants to take your place and that is the simple truth of the world and unless you're willing to stand in that place and defend it someone will come and take it away from you it's no different to cartels in in mexico right once they sense a weakness in the strongest cartel what happens Someone comes after it, it fragments, they form a new thing, they start again. That's how power works, and there's no escaping it. On the, the power front, mm. um, and then I'll come back to the, the beliefs that lead us astray. On the power front, yeah, it, the truth of the world is, is deeply uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and there's something very weird about that nature is red in tooth and claw. So for anybody that's heard that but never stopped to think about it, uh, what it means is you stop your enemy. And unfortunately, I'm actually really curious to get your emotional take on. So I've seen a lot of the footage coming out of the Israel-Hamas conflict. Mm -hmm. It's doing something to me that I really don't like the way it makes me feel. And I watched one today. Wow, I'm getting emotional. I watched one today where um, there was... a. Uh, somebody from Hamas going through and they had a camera like a GoPro or whatever on their head and they're just filming it and through the window they shoot and kill somebody you can't really see it but you hear the person die it's crazy and then um, that person ends up getting shot and killed and I just thought to kill another human you rip their body like you tear a hole in their organs they bleed out it's violent and painful and simple and fast and watching that person die i mean they die fast man like at the end somebody shoots him i don't know sniper what single shot not even like a da -da -da -da, just pow drops you hear him he's talking it oh dude it was just so crazy and that nature is red in tooth and claw we have not escaped nature Mm -hmm. Not entirely, but there is something about how much progress we've made that is thrilling. And when I think about how much prosperity and how much um, peace the Western world on our home turf, because I am well aware of mm -hmm. the horrendous forever wars that we have gotten into, but on our own home turf, 
how much of that we have had. And what scares me is that it's huge blessings, huge blessings, and also seems to derange our thinking in some way. Mm. Going back to the idea some people need to be chased by a lion. Like there is something about human nature that has to be, has to be, this the wrong way to think about it. If it isn't kept in check, that that a way of thinking becomes pathologized and we the oh god i'm explaining an idea that i have not had to articulate out this is why i love having you on uh the group begins to vibrate stick with me mm -hmm. the group begins to vibrate it and sounds like a sexual fantasy mate mm, let's see <laughs> oh it doesn't end like one i don't think not for me <clears throat> uh the group begins to vibrate and the individual gets lost collective thinking takes over and all hell breaks loose and that all hell breaks loose can be just a uh, a weakening and so a stronger force from the outside comes in and takes over or it can be um i'd have to really think about times where the group the collective becomes like a, a mouse china or something like that um that worries me the deranging of that to keep it on things that we've already talked about in this conversation when you get the pulling all of the structure apart so that there is nothing left to push back on so that everyone is equal everyone is the same nobody is worse off because we have the luxury to believe that so um i say that because if um great example if somebody broke in to the this studio right now and they said okay we um you have to win a debate or everyone here dies i would Im immediately go okay constance is a better debater than me so constantine sorry so um you you go do the debating mm -hmm. and i would just have because i don't want anybody to get shot i don't need to be right I just need somebody that I've seen do it and I know that they're good at it, boom. So now reality slaps you in the face and everybody lines up behind that. But when there is none of that, mm -hmm. you get this slow decay and the slow decay is hard to protect against. And that's where we are, I think. Uh, that's exactly where we are. We've become very uncomfortable with... Look, this is a very, very difficult thing to talk about, okay? But I think we have to talk about it, particularly in this moment. So. I've talked to, we've got a, uh, I don't know when this will go out, but we have an episode with Sam Harris and Eric Weinstein com oh, coming yes. out. Um, we talked about Israel and Palestine a lot. And the thing that we were talking about is this. World War II ended because the United States dropped two nuclear weapons on Japan and because of what happened to Germany, okay? Now, when the United States dropped, I think it was Hiroshima, when they dropped that nuke, they, afterwards, one of those two, they went and measured the blast impact of those detonations. Not the release of energy from the nuclear weapons, which is much greater, but the blast impact. And they calculated how many conventional munitions you would have to use to achieve the same blast impact on a city. When they did those calculations, there's a Russian historian uh, called Mark Salonian who's gone through all of this. In the last year and a half of World War II, the Allies, that's mainly the Brits, the Americans and the Soviets, dropped 50 Hiroshima's a month on Germany. Whoa. Every month for 18 months. They wiped Germany off the map, flattened cities, hundreds of thousands of people burnt alive. Now, historians have come along and, say, and have said that was too much, that was unjustifiable, that was wrong, etc. But the fact is that Germany was in the, death, in the grips of a death cult. Hitler said, we're going to make a final stand, we're not going to retreat, we're not going to capitulate, we're not going to surrender. Uh, and that is what happened. And the only way the Allies could win that war was to kill a hell of a lot of innocent people. Okay? Are we saying that was wrong? Are we saying that murdering, not murdering, sorry, killing millions of innocent civilians in war is wrong? Well, I think so, don't you? Yes. Can you win a war without doing it? No. no. I don't know, I will say that. No, you Doesn't can't. Look like it. You can't. You can't. So 
what does that we are in so if you accept my premise then we are in a moral paralysis right now because if you want to win the war you have to kill innocent civilians and we don't want to kill innocent civilians what's the outcome we can't win the war and that's where we are that's where we are okay so power as the returning theme uh i imagine people are getting squeamish what you point you keep saying at, that but what what does squeamish mean it means that they're going to what i mean by that now is people are going to reject a tool because it can also be used to um do horrendous things so i saw a tweet um that said there there is only tragedy in the um israeli-palestine conflict mm -hmm. there's no good that can come of it no nah, that's not what they said there's only tragedy that is what they said mm -hmm. Uh, and I wish I had memorized it because it was a really eloquent description of it's, it's not good guys, bad guys. It's just tragedy every which way you look. And nature is red in tooth and claw and there is tragedy to that. But I don't know that there is any way to escape it. And relinquishing your power is not the way to do it. As somebody who thinks in movies, I will remind everybody of Superman 2. Uh, when Superman gives up his powers because he wants to just be a normal person and be in love with Lois Lane and do the things that a normal person would do only to then find out that he gets knocked around by the bully and to help people has to uh, get his powers back. It's interesting. I have not thought about that uh, metaphor, but yeah, that I think is the very hard lesson we're learning that it feels really good to focus on how much I love my wife, mm -hmm. to focus on how much I care about uh, my team here at Impact Theory, mm -hmm. to focus on the people that I'm trying to help with the show. But there's a reason why I talk constantly about the imagery that I use to keep myself motivated is me in a loincloth covered in the blood of my enemies. Mm -hmm. And I have to channel that willingness to be hard, to be tough, uh, in order to stay focused, to not give up, to not fall into a weak mindset. Mm -hmm. Here's another quote that I wish I had memorized, but I'll get you close with a paraphrase. This is George Washington. Uh, George Washington said, when a group of people loses their hard fighting disposition, um, they can no longer claim themselves to be among the best. Just as cowardice is a mortal sin in the individual it is a mortal sin at the population level and i was like whoa like especially when you understand his role and what he did in order to help america get the american experiment off the ground uh, which is hopefully something we'll get to before the end of this talk like what the american experiment is why it matters why it's not owned by america one of the aspects that we're circling around here is, is sacrifice Think about what George Washington did. He led hundreds of thousands of men, many of whom were maimed and killed, into battle over what? An idea. The idea that you people in this country should be free of external tyranny. And he sacrificed men's lives to achieve it. Now, we would agree that killing people is bad, maiming people is bad. We don't want any civilian or anyone killed, do we? Because we're good, moral, virtuous people. But that is not how the world works. If you want to achieve goals, inevitably that will happen, right? If you want to defend your country, you have to sacrifice. Some men, usually men, almost always men, have to sacrifice themselves. And someone who's in charge of that will be in charge of, do we send these people here? Do we send them there? Some of them are going to die. We're in moral paralysis in the West at a level of society. We still have generals. We still have, you know, presidents who will press the button and send men into battle and whatever. But at a level of society, we are incapable of understanding that reality. We're incapable of understanding the fact that, look, the Israel-Palestine situation is a perfect example of this. If you believe that Hamas is a terrorist organization, you understand that this was Israel's 9-11 and Israel has to destroy Hamas. 
if Israel has to destroy Hamas, Hamas using civilians as a shield means that civilians are going to die. I don't feel comfortable being the guy, yeah, 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 press that button, go on. I'm not happy saying that. I'm not saying that. But the people making that decision, if they want to destroy Hamas, have to take innocent life. That's the moral quandary that the entire world is in. And the reason that Israel is particularly in that position, it is being forced to play by Western rules against people who play by a completely different set of rules, who don't operate on those values whatsoever. It's interesting calling them Western rules. I like to think, hmm, I haven't thought about this, so I can tell that what I'm about to say is ill-informed, but I'll walk through the way that I was thinking about it and then I'll sort of self-correct. Um, what I was going to say is I like to believe that as a society finds itself prosperous, uh, not quite true. This is how I know <laughs> this is ill-informed. Uh, okay, there are two ways to approach it. You've got the individualistic way, you've got the collectivist way. You can achieve extraordinary things through both as China's shown over the last, whatever, 30 mm. years has been absolutely breathtaking to see that level. Um, I just have a feeling that that one deranges a little more quickly than does the individual. So if you made me place a bet on which one is uh, going to yield the best results over time, I would say that betting on the individual, uh, meaning individual freedoms, property rights, all the things that we'll call Western values. Um, I think that that makes sense. I think the once you do that and you make the individual, you think of them as having a divine spark within them and that each individual is precious and, and not this disposable thing, um, that that has a self-correcting mechanism in it that leads to what we're seeing now. Now, we have looped back to beliefs that end up creating um, the uh, the pathology, and we'll we'll keep going through some of them because I think it's pretty fascinating. But I that to me, I think, makes a lot of sense. So I want to believe that any society that bets on the um, in elevating the individual, the individual as the um, the right unit of account as you begin to analyze what to do, what not to do, uh, that it requires you to look at them as sacred individuals and thusly protect them and thusly. Any society that goes down that path is going to find themselves not wanting to use human shields or blow up human shields. Um, so anyway, I think I navigated that reasonably well. I stopped myself from the most absurd uh, trip ups, which is that a collectivist society can work. Um, I just have a feeling that it because it only requires one person to become pathologized, that uh, that has a tendency to end in tyranny and bad news much faster, but it's certainly not impossible for either system mm. uh, to end up there. Okay. Anything on more on that belief? No. Okay. So uh, I, ha I have more. Mm. So problematic beliefs that cause collapse that I want people to pay attention to, because if you adjust these in your own life, not only do I hope that that means the collective won't derange, that it means if we really are living through effectively the modern version of the Roman collapse. So this is gonna help you see opportunities if you can avoid these problematic beliefs. Okay, so prosperity is a fundamental law of human nature. I feel like people believe that that's true. What do you think? Dumb people believe that that's true. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe I take that back. Lucky people, people in the Western world believe that that's true because they've never experienced anything else. But that isn't the world. Uh, the world is very, very different to that. And this is one of the things I've made it my business to remind everybody, you know, we talk endlessly about all sorts of forms of privilege, this privilege, that privilege, you know, the, the real privilege that we all enjoy is Western privilege, first world privilege. Uh, and we have been very comfortable for a very long time in that privilege. And we have forgotten that life for the overwhelming majority of people throughout human history has been an immense struggle for survival. Prosperity is not a given. It is a product of the things that we have been very lucky to enjoy in the West. And the values that we have are what has allowed us to build it, which is why they're important to preserve. So prosperity, prosperity is not a human right. It, it doesn't fall out of the sky. It's not on your birth certificate. Prosperity is a product of action. It's a product of action in your personal life. It's a product of action at the level of society. For you to enjoy the prosperity that you enjoy, you have to work your butt off 
as you have done and be smart and be creative and be driven and be talented and have great ideas that you test against reality and fail and recover and adjust. That's how you build prosperity in your own life and countries are no different. I heard a really cool quote, I'll paraphrase. I mentioned it earlier. In the capitalist system, people recognize that prosperity is the miracle. In a socialist system, people get confused and think that redistribution is the miracle. Mm. So if it's true that it's the rules and rules of thumb that really are going to equate to your level of success, whether that's emotional success, financial success, societal success, uh, what are high level rule sets? The, the two that came to mind the fastest, just at the highest, highest level were capitalism and socialism. So I was like, all right, Without looking it up, what would I define these two systems as? So for capitalism, I said individuals try to, con try to contribute to the group and prosperity is their reward if successful. For socialism, I said the group takes from the individual to divide prosperity evenly. And what do you think about those? definitions first of all pretty good i mean they're obviously by definition extraordinarily simplified yes but but broadly speaking yes okay so when you look at those rule sets one of them i think acknowledges that prosperity is going to be hard to come by that's why i said because originally i was like individuals contribute contribute to the group and prosperity is their reward and i was like hold on because you're going to try to contribute. You may not be able to. Society may say, I don't like your contribution. The one that kills me, society may say, you're not smart enough to contribute meaningfully. That one is hard, but real. And there are going to be people that just do not have the intellectual horsepower to contribute meaningfully to society. And hence, I like a social safety net of some kind, mm -hmm. like looking out for people, wanting to help people, I, all of that's amazing. Anyway, socialism <laughs> takes that prosperity for granted and does not realize that you can break the very thing that creates the prosperity, which is giving people the individual freedom to try to contribute to the group. And if they're able to do that successfully, that prosperity is their reward. They are able to create a differential between themselves and other people. They're actually able to do that. Now, of course, anybody that's familiar with the Gini coefficient knows that if that gap between the haves and the have-nots becomes too much, you are basically guaranteed violence mm -hmm. because people can actually be poor and it's not a problem if everyone around them is poor. Mm -hmm. Where it becomes a problem is if your neighbor is super wealthy and you're even normal, like you have a refrigerator, you have air conditioning, you have a PlayStation, like you can have it all. But if your neighbor is Elon Musk, mm. now there's a real problem. And he has right. rocket ships and <laughs> makes his own cars, all that stuff. So um, they can be a problem. But if you fail to recognize that you that prosperity is by default, everyone is broke all through human history and everyone but the smallest number of like royal people just suffered endlessly and were victims of just climate just mm. you froze to death you overheated just was or you starved to death probably even way more common you ever feel like you're hustling as a creator working non-stop to grow your online business but you never hit your revenue goals kajabi is the tool you need to make more money more ways and more efficiently it's a one-stop shop to turn your skills, passions, and experiences into enriching online courses, exclusive membership sites, thriving communities, personalized coaching, subscription podcasts, and more. All of which is underpinned by robust analytics, marketing tools, third-party integrations, and easy payment options. And with Kajabi, you have 100% control with free templates that you easily customize, even if you're not tech savvy. Right now, Kajabi is offering a 30-day free trial to start your own business. Just go to kajabi.com slash impact theory. That's K-A-J-A-B-I dot com slash impact theory. Earn more doing what you love. All right, here's a new one. Can we pause on nature yeah. has no rules? Because I think one of the interesting things about this, all, all of this thing is um, the biggest problem with blank slatism is the attempt to pretend that human nature doesn't exist, that humans are not wired to be predisposed to certain things. And it's an incredibly unscientific belief, given that we know that we evolved, we're evolved creatures, and therefore um, it, it's, it's kind of, it's obviously understandable, but at the same time very silly to think that 
horrible things that human beings do are some kind of weird occurrence. You know, oh, I can't believe there's a war somewhere. Really? Why don't you look at our history? When was the last time human beings were not fighting over something? We are tribal chimps that evolved to do what we do. And all of the terrible pathologies of human beings are a product of our evolution to a very large extent. So when we know that that is the case, we prepare for war and therefore are kept safe. When we pretend that is not the case, we don't prepare for war and we go, oh my God, I can't believe we've been invaded. So the denial of the existence of human nature is, is pathological and very dangerous. Yeah, this one, I, I don't... This one I don't understand. And this is the thing that's really um, been an animating force for me. So as I think about, okay, impact theory, what is impact theory? It's a belief that they're, the only difference between me and the level of success that I've had and the other average people, because I consider myself very average, is a set of ideas. Many of the ideas that we're talking about right now today. And the one that I find the, the most jarring that people don't just rush to embrace is that 50% of the way you work is hardwired. You're not gonna get around it. And so I've thought a lot about then why is it that people can get confused? Mm -hmm. Because they, they can get confused and they can make very compelling arguments. And so because I never wanna assume that, oh, I've really got this mapped out, I'm like, okay, wait, how is it that people are so confused about this? And they're confused because there's 50% of you that is malleable and we can change a lot. So in fact, I mean, let's confront um, gender non-conforming square on it really is happening and a lot more people maybe it's still a tiny tiny number maybe it's still only one and a half percent of people whatever um they're actually they feel accurate in saying that i while my body may be male i am a woman and if we can let's Let's assume that some people at the edges are totally lying. Men, oh God, you guys have a really funny name for it. Prison onset gender dysphoria. Yeah, it's when you get when somebody who's a trans woman, that a male with a penis, gets arrested and goes to court. Suddenly they're like, oh, I, I'm a woman now. You know, ra rapid on prison onset gender dysphoria. You see a bit of prison coming your way, suddenly you're, you're gender dysphoric. So <laughs> setting that aside, I, I have a sense that there really are people that they really do believe that. Sure. And so something is malleable enough that they, because I'll, I don't even think all of them started that way. I think some people, this comes on very late in life. Um, so the question becomes, why are they able to get, and I don't mean this, this word derogatorily, why are they able to get confused? Why are they able to be migrated from here I am feeling male to now I'm not? What, what allows for that confusion, do you think? Well, we have done a lot of interviews with various people, including many trans people. Uh, and the conclusion is that gender dysphoria is a mental illness. It's a mental illness. So people have all kinds of mental illnesses. They feel that they shouldn't have an arm. They feel that they shouldn't have this. They feel that they shouldn't have that. They are distressed by various aspects of their body. Some people think... Some people look in the mirror and see someone who's fat while they're, they're really, really thin. We call that anorexia. Um, some people eat food and then go to the bathroom and, and throw it up, right? Uh, that we call that bulimia. And actually, interestingly, many of the people, particularly young women who are now gender dysphoric, are the ones that used to have anorexia and bulimia, statistically speaking, in the past. So they're able to do that on on an individual level because you know human brains have variability that they're not perfect some people uh experience distress some people experience illness we all experience illness of one kind or another at some point um but we don't go well i am diabetic therefore i now identify as healthy right um so it's I, I i don't say this in any unkind way i have a lot of empathy for people who suffer from these conditions i really truly do we have someone that works at trigonometry uh who is a, we had her on recently i don't know if you caught that episode mm -hmm. an employee of ours and that's what she says it's, it's a disorder it's a mental disorder um that people need help with the problem is in our society today we have created the idea that you can identify out of reality 
Uh, and all you have to do is re replace the, wo the word identity with pretend to be or claim to be or whatever, and everything suddenly makes sense. There are some men who pretend to be women, or there are some men who feel that they are women, or who claim to be women, and they're allowed to feel that they're women. There's nothing, that's, that's their right. You can dress whatever way you want. If you turn up here in a dress, that's your right. L let's not say pretend, let's feel that, right? Some people feel that they are the opposite sex. I may feel that I'm a six foot four NBA player. I'm not. And indulging that delusion of mine isn't kindness. It's not virtuous. It's not right. It doesn't help me. It doesn't help anyone. Now, if people want to identif identify any which way and they're not hurting anybody, that's absolutely fine. But indulging their feelings, pretending that we agree with them when we don't, is not helping anyone. All right, let me take the molten lava potato really fast. Okay. And uh, I have a slightly different take on this. Okay. So here's what I think is going on. I've not looked at enough research to say, oh, I know that my, um, my assessment is based on that, but uh, this is gonna hang together, I think, pretty well. So the way the, way the brain is, is structured, it is hyper fragmented, hyper fragmented. Mm -hmm. And take vision, for instance. There is a part of your vision um, designed to see red, a part of your vision designed to see blue, a uh, part of your vision designed designed to see green, and you put them all together, and, and now we're able to see the panoply of colors. Uh, but there's also a part of your vision, uh, the vision cortex, that is designed to see right angles, mm -hmm. that's designed to track motion, that's designed to see where edges meet. All of those are separate regions, and so I can damage them selectively. So I could take you and damage just the part of your brain that tracks motion. Now you can still see perfectly, but everything is a snapshot. So mm -hmm. if you were pouring water, it would be empty cup, halfway cup, full cup, overflowing cup. And you wouldn't be like we can, where it's like, oh, I can just stop. Or uh, if anybody has ever seen the illusion where you stare at a waterfall and then you look away and suddenly the rocks look like they're moving up because you've so overstimulated the part of your brain that tracks the downward motion, mm. that as soon as it doesn't have input coming in, everything else looks like it's moving up. Mm -hmm. So you, the, the brain really is broken into a lot of regions. And for a long time, I couldn't understand what people were arguing about with um, gender dysphoria because they were saying, I'm a woman. And I'm like, bro, you have a penis. Like, what is happening right now? Like, honestly, I actually didn't understand. I didn't even, under like, what are we talking about? <clears throat> and so I was all for the like, what is a woman? And it was, it was outright hilarious to me. I was just like, how are we not able to define what a woman is? And so then again, I'm like, whenever I get cocky like that, I stop myself. I look for disconfirming evidence. So I was like, okay, what's going on? I have that feeling that this is funny, but something tells me that they're, assume they're well-intentioned. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I su assume they're well-intentioned, you either come down to, they, they have a region of their brain that is um, damaged, under active what I, I don't mean to use a derogatory word i'm just groping for a way to describe it is not doing what one would expect in the same way that if you damage uh rgb in the eyes people somebody becomes colorblind okay so um they if if i take that assumption that they're not doing this on purpose they're not trying to fuck with me like they they really are experiencing something i was like okay what what if what they're saying is the brain is broken into all these hyper fragments which i already know to be true and the part of my body that's mapped to the fact that I have a penis is very separate than the part of my brain that is giving me the feelings that then society maps onto that says, oh, those feelings are associated with femininity. These feelings are associated with masculinity. So I'm like, whoa, I have all the feeling set that everyone is telling me is associated with femininity. And I may even have a region of my brain that draws me to um, the, the sexuality would be an easy one. So dude, no one had to tell me to be attracted to women. Like I just, I had a pull, mm -hmm. right? I would see something and, and like, I mean, there's no way to say it other than that. I think Jordan Peterson summed it up brilliantly when he said, you can entertain a boy with two circles and a triangle. And I was like, you didn't have to tell me to find, I remember drawing stick figures and <laughs> being like, this is hot <laughs> as a kid mm. seems weird, yeah. but like, that's just how my brain is wired. So clearly there is a part of my brain that just has a pull to that. But if 
that part of my brain was pulled in the other direction, <clears throat> obviously that would feel very real. And so if people are telling me, oh, women are attracted to that and I'm attracted to it, then I would be like, even though my body manifests masculine, I'm now able to be, uh, I am malleable in that way because I'm, I'm the part of my psychology, brain mapping, however you wanna think about it, pushes me in that direction. Society then can nudge me in that direction. And now all of a sudden, I am malleable. And the way I've always thought about it is uh, any human is like 120 sided dice rolled. And then whatever all those weird combinations and one of the 100 sided dice is masculine, feminine. One of the 100 sided dice is has penis, has vagina, mm -hmm. right? And th those are binary. I'm not arguing that at all. So from a sex perspective, binary, from how I feel perspective may really not be binary. And depending on where I fall in that scale, then I can be influenced by what culture says is this way, that way. And then to bring in what you're talking about, uh, the brain, again, research, this one is researched, uh, the brain will justify whatever feeling it gets. So if I get the feeling that something is wrong, my brain is gonna go, oh, the reason you feel uneasy is uh, because you're too fat, uh -huh. bulimia. Oh, no, 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 the reason that you're feeling uneasy is because you're a man trapped in a woman's body. And then the brain's like, oh, okay, cool, that's the story. So the brain will not let anything uh -huh. go unexplained and therefore I'm gonna map that story on now because that's what society's handing me. But when I started thinking about that, I was like, whoa, like that's, people are malleable. There is 50%, we're not a blank slate. I aggressively disagree with that. And I think anybody that believes that is gonna be led down a path of, of problems because it will break your ability to predict the outcome of your actions. Mm. But we're 50% malleable. And so now it gets into, okay, are there ways to, um, there's no better word, shape. There is a better word. Should we shape people into constraints? Timmy, you're a boy and you should think like a boy. And so I can nudge him in those directions. Great book called Nudge. Highly encourage people to read it. And so I nudge him in the direction of masculinizing him. And so now eh, maybe I could have nudged him. I can't, if he's not attracted to women, I'm not gonna be able to push him towards women. If he's not attracted to men, I'm not gonna be able to push him. But if he's leaning one way or the other, I can now nudge and get that going in a direction. And so now in a world, bringing us back to where we started, where I am now going to remove all of those structural categories because I don't like the limitations that they place on me and there's no lion and so I'm never chased and I can <sighs> afford these luxury beliefs. And that's how we begin, that malleability shaping people really is a part of this. It isn't just, because I get why you call it mental illness, because if you're misaligned, there certainly is a misalignment. Uh, how does that land for you? Uh, I think that you, and this is what all of us do when we're trying to wrap our head around this issue, including myself a few years ago, we deliberately confuse maleness with masculinity and femaleness with femininity in order to be more comfortable having the conversation. I actually don't. That isn't my hangup because for me, ma male, female is easy. Right. It's when somebody is using uh, male, female as monikers for feeling masculine or feeling feminine that this gets all tangled up. Well, this is what I'm saying. These things, I have female friends who are very masculine in terms of how they think and behave. I have a female wife that's like that. So uh, I know exactly what you mean. Now, does that make her less female? No. So in other words, how you feel and whether you feel masculine or feminine is not a determinant of whether you're male or female. Correct. Therefore, feeling female does not make a male female. Correct. Therefore, this whole conversation is pointless. False. That's where I would say that it is deranging as I watch very smart people either act as if they can't see the difference in what people are saying, because what we need is just another word for uh, the way that I Feel. So I map my internal emotions onto uh, the standard human with vagina, right? Hold on. The claim that the trans ideology makes and trans activists make is that if I say the words, I am a woman, I am now female. 
That is the claim. So I may be arguing for the wrong thing. And so if they're saying that saying it means that you suddenly have a vagina. Well, that's what self-identification means. I identify as a woman means I feel feminine. Therefore, the fact that I have a penis doesn't matter because my feelings overrule the biological reality. Is that really what I, you're saying? Yes. And I'm there. But hold on. How oh, do they explain the penis? It's a female penis. Mm, okay. So. It's a female penis. Great. Suck it. That's what they want. <laughs> Suck the female penis. There. Now, I will say that uh, that that's what I'm getting at is we, we have I, to. I had to do that. No, it's too funny. Too funny to, to pass up uh, as a fan of comedy. I'm here for it. Uh, but that that begs the point that I'm trying to make, which is we have to differentiate between this human is male female mm -hmm. which i think because for all of human history that's what we've called it let's just stick with that and so we need a new thing that's like i feel like i believe i have the internal brain structure <laughs> that's probably very misleading because i could scan your brain and see it's not true i have the internal uh, feelings brain makeup mm. because it will be it will be i think hypothesis hypothesis much better to say i feel then well, you... we're going to get to the I feel part, but I have a feeling mm -hmm. that the I feel part is nudged by that 20 sided dice that some people were we able to truly just map all the confluence of things that make you feel masculine, and feminine, just like my wife. There's something about her from the time she was a little kid. She was tomboyish. Mm -hmm. So it's like she's got a thing that just like predisposes her to being a little bit aggressive, um, not being as emotional. I know some people are going to freak out about that, but my wife is very um, not as emotionally sober as me, which she will be the first to tell you but way more emotionally sober than um, somebody else uh, that falls more typically on the feminine spectrum. Jesus, this is why we need words for this. So, <laughs> well, this is why simplicity solves this. You are I don't think it does. It, do it really, really okay, does. I'm going to listen. Okay. Tell me. Look, look, maybe I'm not letting you talk, but no, no, you let's are, come back to the female penis. I love you so much. Talking to you about this is amazing. You've given me all the space. I just want to make sure that I understand okay. where you're coming from. So, the trans ideology claim, or the trans activist claim, mm -hmm. is that self-identification is how you know whether someone is female or male. Self-identification means abracadabra Stacy. <laughs> Having uttered the incantation, I am a woman, I become Stacy. Okay? Yes. And therefore, I am entitled to be treated in our society the way a woman is treated. I am entitled to be housed in a female prison. I am entitled to go into a female changing room. I am entitled to compete in female sports. I am entitled to be treated as a woman because I am a woman. That is completely outrageous and unacceptable. If the claim were, I am male, but I feel that I have a set of behaviors that our society conventionally associates with females, and I therefore wish to wear a dress, wish to have my hair long, wish to wear makeup, wish to paint my fingernails, wish to uh, change the way I speak, wish to dress in a way that most women do. Cool, go do it, be you. But the moment you make the claim that you are a woman, you are making a claim, A, a truth claim that isn't true, and B, a claim that entitles you to the certain protections that we've allocated to women uh, in our society, which you're not entitled to by virtue of the fact that you're not female. Does that, does that work as a starting basis for this conversation? It works as a starting basis for this conversation. I'm gonna steal, man, everything you said, because that is as I understand it. And I think that there is a thing, a demarcation point that we have to draw that uh, I think ultimately, uh, I, I won't prognosticate about where we end up. Uh, so I'm going to steal man the argument. Let me know if I miss anything. So uh, a trans activist would say that the thing that makes me male or female is the way that I feel. And if I, regardless of whether I have the genitalia of a male, if I feel female and I say that I'm female, then I I am a woman. If I feel like a woman and I say I'm a woman, I am a woman. Uh, and therefore, 
you should treat me and give me all the protections that a woman would get. So spaces that are reserved for women, I should have access to that. Prisons that are reserved for women, I should have access to that. Um, sports, I should be able to play in sports and compete against other females. Have I understood the argument? Yes. Okay. So operating from that, mm -hmm. and I will say, I'm, I'm talking to everybody now, like, hey, everybody that wants to have this conversation, there is a conversation to be had, but you really have to begin to break these things apart. Now, given what you just said, I think there's going to be a bone of contention. Here, here's how I feel that on the trans activist side, there is a refusal. Mm, they, they've created a category, maybe. So what I was going to say is uh, from the trans activist side, there's a refusal to create a category for people that are in alignment, both with the physical sex of their body and their feelings. No, they call those cis. cis. Yes. Yeah. So that's why I stopped myself. Um, uh, so what I uh, there, they are um, perhaps not being intellectually honest about how we need to categorize things. So let me walk through this. The, the way that I would want to have a productive conversation is um, everything in its category so that we may then talk honestly about the consequences, the second and third order consequences of these categorizations. So um, one, I'm introducing a, a new thing to the argument, because even if I'm willing to adopt this, which I'm not, there's something about that that makes me feel manipulated because they're trying to co-op something that's existed for so long. I'm totally cool for introducing a new category. There's something that I haven't thought through about why I don't like the co-opting of something old that feels um, sleight of hand. So I'm gonna set that aside for a second. Uh, so I'm introducing a new idea to this discussion or trying to, which is that um, I think that there is, there is something to be said about being nudged. And there's a malleability in here. And if we're not being honest about the malleability, we won't understand why it's important to get the categorization right. Because I'm saying that there is a, uh, once we once we say, okay, the, the biology is pretty clear, you're either male or female. And yeah, look, some things in the margins, pretty fascinating, but so marginal for people that have both a penis hmm. and a vagina, which does happen, crazy, but true. Um, setting that aside for a second everything about the brain does feel like it's a hyper fragmented and b that everything's a spectrum which is why i have always considered myself to have a slightly more feminine temperament my wife has a slightly more masculine temperament and that is one of the reasons that our marriage is so good and when i give marriage advice to people i always feel a little bad because i'm like well if your wife is hyper feminine and you're hyper masculine, this is all going to be a fucking nightmare. And good luck because you guys, one of you really is from Mars and the other really is from fucking Venus and your alien species. And goddamn, you can raise kids, but holy hell, like the two of you trying to like really um, be each other's soulmates and get all the things that I'm telling you you're going to get, probably not so much. No, no, that's been exactly my experience. Yes, but are you hyper masculine? Yeah. Okay, cool. Then he's, it can work he's out. He's calling out my masculinity right on camera. I, Unbelievable. Because I have an internal definition of hypermasculine of the Jocko Willink is hypermasculine. Yeah, but and if he's able to do it, then word. Being just, masculine isn't about having muscles, but anyway, he, it's not. Can we agree that there is a category of human that I call a pub brawler in the UK? And yes. you can take one look at that motherfucker and be like, oh, I know a lot about you based on the shape of your head. Yes. Okay. So I'm just saying there really are things that manifest physically that like. You've defined well, masculinity in a very narrow way. I haven't defined masculinity. I have not made any attempt to define masculinity yet. Oh, okay. Sorry. Other than We're I have earlier big, said. Big cans God, of worms. I know. If viewers are having as much fun listening as I am talking, we'll keep going. Cool. Uh, Okay, so I'm trying to introduce this idea of nudgeability. We are malleable. We are, we are shapeable. You can sway somebody. My wife has made me more masculine over time because she's actually more into that. She probably takes for granted the part of me that's hyper communicative and in touch with my emotions and able to admit my insecurities. She probably just takes it for granted. But honestly, there was a time in our relationship where she straight said to me, your insecurities aren't sexy. And I quote, and I was like, oh, God damn. So I realized, A, that's true. I need to fucking toughen up here, deal with my insecurities, be a bit more manly. And she was way more into that, which she rewarded them with sexual attention. I'm fucking nudgeable. Like you can encourage me in directions. So anyway, <clears throat> I want nudgeability 
malleability, shapeability in here. So that then we have to ask questions. What direction are we going to nudge people? Because you're going to nudge people, whether you mean to or not. And seeing celebrities dress their boys up in dresses, you're nudging them, mm -hmm. whether you mean to or not. You're mm -hmm. nudging, you're shoving them. So, but hey, blue and trucks and all that, one could argue is not nudging, is shoving, whatever. But let's have that on the table. Okay, so if we are somewhat malleable, but trying to push somebody all the way in a direction ends in fucking disaster. I forget the kid's name, the set of twins, born, circumcised, the circumcision machine burns his penis off. Mm -hmm. uh, I think his name was David or his code name was David. Yes. And do you remember the- John Money is the John guy who Money, did it. John Money, thank you. And so he said, oh, it doesn't matter. Blank slate, raise him as, a, as your daughter. It's gonna be fine, he'll never know. And of course, ends up committing suicide. His brother commits suicide. Fucking crazy and stuff. And John Money was a pedophile. Lovely. Uh, if that's written and taken out of context, I'm kidding. That's obviously <laughs> horrifying. Uh, there are limits to how far we can nudge them. We need, we need the categories. We need to understand where people are going to fall so that we are, we are very open and honest about, yeah, you can push people in a direction. There will be second and third order consequences. You need to really be thoughtful about what that is. And when in doubt, I would say, looking at history to find a way of something that has worked not perfectly, but reasonably well, uh, would be probably the place to start with that. I'm going to pause there. No, Tom, I'm finished. But. Let me say a couple yeah, of things please. at this juncture. I love you. I really look up to you. I learn a hell of a lot from you. I really admire you, and I have no fucking idea what you're talking about. Okay. Because I need to simplify. I don't yes. think you're addressing the argument that I'm making is the reason I have no idea what you're talking well, about. Well, so we'll get to that. Okay. So I'll, I'll get to that now and then okay. maybe we'll circle back. Okay. Okay, so... Remind me about masculinity as well because uh, there's something to say on that. Okay. Should a biological male have access to female spaces? Would that be a direct... That's part of the conversation, yeah. yeah. So to me, the obvious answer is no. Let's go up a level. Is... The truth claim that I am Stacy accurate. Um, it, what would I have to do to become Stacy, in your opinion? Tell me to call you Stacy, but that's why we have to differentiate between you feel like Stacy. What would I have to do to be female in your eyes? Um, that's why we need a new category because I'm perfectly willing to say that there is such a thing as <laughs> I, I already know that the community has completely rejected this idea as a neophyte. I would have said, Oh, trans woman, like that works. I guess I have they, suggested that as an idea. Yeah. So for me, if that didn't have baggage, that would be, yeah, perfect. You're Stacy, the trans woman. I'm totally here for that. I'm here for that too, but nobody's willing to go I, with that. I have a feeling that that probably represents the mainstream belief, but it's just very difficult to have this conversation. Okay. That's if, a guess. Okay, fine. Wrong. So if I am a trans woman, am I entitled to go in a female bathroom or compete in female sports? Bathrooms, I don't have a read on because that one feels like it gets complicated very fast. I've not, I have not thought through that. I don't know, but uh, for sure, not in female sports. Okay, cool. I agree. And I would say anywhere where you're going to be naked, not. Right. So any uh, prison where there's massive vulnerability, not. Yeah. So you basically believe that people should be called by the name that they wish to be called by. In an ideal world, we would have a category that describes them as not being the sex in which they were born. Right. Yeah, I'm going to create a mental map huh. of you. Yeah. Based on my experience with you and what you tell me is true. And so if you really, like uh, the first um, transgender person that I met, I, that, that I knowingly met, I was so surprised because I expected, and people forgive me and I'm showing my age and all of that, uh, but the, when I f met somebody who was transgender for the first time, I didn't know transgender was a thing. I knew that transsexual was a thing, but I thought of them as like campy and over the top. And so I was expecting a drag queen. Mm. And I met this really like, casual, down home, hair down, straight, no makeup, like woman who 
trans woman who I was just like, oh, wow. Like I didn't, I immediately updated my mental map of what that could be and was like, oh, I literally had no idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I was like, cool. My mental map of you is now that. Now she had not had her penis removed. So I was like, word, like mental map is that you are a male who feels entirely feminine. Well, that's where we started cool. with me saying that. Feels like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, so where the, the line that I was trying to draw is, I think there's a reason for that, that occurs in the brain. And this is where the conversation to me just like completely derails, is everybody is so talking as if they can't understand that there's another category. Now, I'm again, I may just be so new to this conversation that people have already had this and that everyone's just gonna completely reject the idea of, of that new category. Um, and in which case, then I'm at a loss and I'm not trying to convince anybody. Look, other than if, if the trans ideology and trans activists said, we would like to be called trans women and trans men to reflect the fact that we are of a certain biological sex, but we want to present to the world as uh, the opposite of that. I actually don't think anybody would have a problem with that beyond the, the specific narrow context which we've discussed. Mm. Uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation if that was acceptable to people at all. Yep. <clears throat> Can we come back to masculinity? Yeah, please. Because I think this is very interesting. Uh, I was once at a dinner, uh, the small dinner was about tw tw 12 of us maybe, with Jordan Peterson. Uh, and I asked him what Western civilization is. And Jordan, in, as is his style, went off on a 20 minute thing. And I was like, I have no fucking idea where you're God going, Jordan, him. right? But what he said was very interesting. He said that he talked about how in, chimp groups the alpha male is quite often one of the smallest males in other words it's not a jocko wilnick mm. it's uh, me or i mean you're bigger than me but you know it's one of us and the reason for that is that the alpha male strategy the pub brawler strategy in groups does not work very well for very long you are only on top as long as you are physically the strongest male in that group uh, and and when two or more smaller chimps can get together and kill you, they will. The difference with chimp groups is that the reason the smaller males are often the alpha male is that they're very good at building coalitions. And so to me, masculinity isn't about having big muscles or having a big head or wide fists or whatever. Uh, if we think about our conversation earlier about power, like I remember talking to Ben Shapiro about this and he was like, yeah, there's this guy on the internet who's like, yeah, I could, I could take, I've got big muscles. And he was like, yeah, I could pay people to shoot you. That's the coalition thing, right? Power isn't projected through your fist in the modern world. It's projected through the power that you have over other people as a leader. So to me, uh, being hyper-masculine is not about having big muscles or having a big head. Um, it's about your ability to project power and authority. What kind of leader are you? Uh, and, you know, you mentioned other stuff like your level of aggression and all these, all these other things. So I think defining masculinity as simply a physical thing is, is very narrow. <clears throat> if you had to put people on a spectrum mm -hmm. of masculine, mm -hmm. who pegs out the meter? Is it... Jocko Willink or is it Ben Shapiro? That's probably terrible because Jocko can build coalitions. Is it, um, what's his name? The the fighter, the boxer. He has a show called The Gypsy King. Otherwise I would not. Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury or Ben Shapiro. Who maxes out the masculinity meter? Hmm, that's interesting. I, I think I suspect on that level of analysis, everybody would say Tyson Fury. Yes, I would. You would. However, the 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 question for me is, um, the definition is what predetermines the outcome, mm -hmm. right? Um, I that's I, so important. Yeah. Holy shit! I hope people pull that out. Yeah. Well, how you define so masculinity automatically defines who you think is masculine. Yeah, how right? you define And the question for me is, what, which of those options would I like to be? I could go to the gym and become really big mm -hmm. and strong. I could do, and I did it for a while. Didn't wasn't particularly my thing. I didn't enjoy it. I like being in shape. I don't like having, you know, going to the gym and lifting lots of weights. Oh, I get it. Didn't work for me. And the level of power that that gives you over the power in, in a healthy sense, influence over the world, being able to manifest the things that you want, etc., is minuscule. 
compared to the power that you have by building groups of people who follow you into whatever battle or project or whatever it is you want to do. Um, and then there's the family aspect. How do you treat the women and children in your life? To me, healthy masculinity is a lot about that, actually. So when I see some guy with his shirt off uh, and big muscles talking about how he, you know, he's got 10 hoes or whatever, I, I, don't, I don't really see that as healthy masculinity. Agreed. Some people might do. And I'm sure the Genghis Khan model, which is basically that, some people would say, well, that's, you know, biologically, that is hyper-masculinity because like half the world or whatever is descended from him. Mm. That would have been a great example. Genghis Khan, yeah. not gigantic. No. But is he hyper-masculine? Yeah, I yeah. would say so. To me, like, in <laughs> fact, he pegs the fucking meter. Right. Kill them all, no problem. Just, we're taking over. We run this bitch now. Yeah. And actually... If you look historically, a lot of the leaders who really made a huge impact on human society, they've all been very small. Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin wasn't a big guy, Putin. Do These, you think that plays into it? Of course. Because I could see very easily how... Of course it does. It's like, oh, you think I'm not powerful because I'm smaller <laughs> than you? I will show you. I want to go back, speaking of that, yes. to alpha versus beta. Mm. So... I think we have a delusional sense of what an alpha male is. Mm. I saw a documentary. I used to think an alpha male would be Tyson Fury. Not, I don't know him. He could be the smartest guy on planet Earth. Uh, but the sort of once removed thought of him as, as a fighter, a big, physically intimidating fighter. Um, I saw a documentary about wolves and I was shocked, shocked, I say, when I saw that the alpha male was small. Mm. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? And what I realized in that moment was the alpha is the decision maker. The alpha is the coalition builder. Mm -hmm. The alpha is the one that can think. Mm -hmm. Because again, in, in the marketplace of we are wolves and if we don't take down that caribou, we fucking die. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you go, yeah, bro, that guy, I don't know how, but he knows where to go and he knows where to be and he gives me the look at just the right moment. And when I follow him, I eat. And when I don't, I don't. And so what ends up happening oftentimes is the alpha male is small, but fucking sharp. And the beta male, which in our society has gotten a terrible fucking rap, mm. is the enforcer. And it was watching that documentary was so unreal. So you've got a pack of whatever, six wolves, Alpha, kind of small. Beta, the biggest. Mm -hmm. And when they all went for the kill, the um, beta male came and told everyone to fuck off. Mm. Growled, mm. backed everybody down so the alpha could eat the liver. Mm -hmm. And I was like, holy shit. He's not even doing it for himself. Mm. He's Well, I mean, he is. He's protecting the alpha to make sure that the right person to make the decisions and all of that that can keep the group together, whatever, whatever, is well taken care of, well fed, and has what he needs. So that really got me thinking. So yes, while I agree with you that the person who's going to have the outsized impact isn't necessarily going to be what I will call, quote unquote, the most masculine, mm. because again, all of us are 120 sided dice rolled. Mm -hmm. And so like, hey, maybe I'm as smart as Genghis Khan was, but I'm not vicious like that. Mm -hmm. Like I just, dude, like when I think about people getting stabbed or I'm just like, oh God, mm. like, Clearly, I'm not going to be the guy that goes and takes over the planet. Uh, that should just, I'm way too squeamish for that. Mm. So when I think about the thinking of something on a simplistic scale is probably the flaw in my thinking. And that it's really a far more dimensional, three dimensions, if we want to go all the way to four. It's like you've got a tesseract of traits that makes for masculine, feminine, whatever, which I think leads to also some of the debate because it really is such a complex topic. If somebody can give you a hyper simplified version, I say I'm Stacy, therefore I'm Stacy. It's, it has a lot of gravitational pull because it simplifies a very complicated idea. And sticking with the alpha conversation, who, who was the alpha? Michael Jordan or Scottie Pippen? Scottie Pippen is a lot taller, a lot bigger. Yeah. Who was alpha? Obviously. Kobe or Shaq? Uh -huh. That's a good one. Right? <clears throat> What's really interesting in that one is they were both alpha and that was the problem. That's why they collided. They couldn't, neither could defer to the other. Yes. If Shaq had been the enforcer, 
they probably would have won 20 championships. Right, exactly. Um, but I think ultimately Kobe was the alpha in that situation and Shaq eventually, mm. you know, same with uh, the, the, the lots of situations like that. Look, at, at that level, they're all alphas, but someone's got to be the alpha in that particular group. Yeah, that's interesting. And how fast that happens. When you've been the best ball player in your every team, your middle school team, your high school team, your college team, and then you get to the NBA and you're like, oh shit, I'm like seventh or eighth in the pecking order. Yeah. It becomes a real question about, can you become a, a role player? A role player. Yeah, it's exactly right. right. And he, I forget who it was in, um, I think it was 11 Rings by Phil Jackson and Phil, I know you listen to this show. God, I wish. I had doubt it very much. I so want to get him on. <laughs> uh, He'd be incredible. Oh guess my for God. You. So we've gone out for years and years and years. And he's always like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just not during the basketball season or his team. He probably doesn't even fucking know. But um, anyway, in the book, 11 Rings, I'm almost certain it was in that, that I forget what player he had to approach, but he was like, you're a role player. And the guy actually could do it. He could mm. set his ego aside and be like, even though it might've been Stephen Carr. Like, Steve Kerr, maybe? Steve Kerr, Steve Kerr. Yeah, that you. makes sense. Uh, that even though he had to, like, he had always been the best of the best of the best of the best, he was like, yeah, no, that actually makes sense. Yeah. Cool. I'll do it. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, when we think about these How things. How the fuck do you know an NBA reference? You're Russian. What's I'm going on? I'm massively right into NBA, a huge fan Are of the really? NBA. Yeah, Michael Jordan was my hero. It's one of the reasons the way we talk about race does my head in, because I was like, I was a kid. I didn't care who was black or white. I loved Michael Jordan mm. and I saw myself in him. It didn't matter to me what his skin color was. You know what I mean? That's why divisiveness about race bothers me so much. Uh, but yeah, the NBA, uh, was, you know, I love basketball. It's a great sport, great sport. And uh, a lot of my heroes kind of watching, mm. growing up, watching those those guys. Uh, and sport is beautiful because it's it's ritualized combat. And so it teaches you a lot about human dynamics and tribe dynamics and, you know, different tribes fighting each other and how you marshal that and who has to run the whole thing. I mean, if you think about, you, you know, sticking with the alpha conversation, it's not quite true anymore. But historically speaking, the point guard, the smallest player would usually be the one running the whole show. Mm. That's the role of the point guard. Um, so I think um, our conversation and also, you know, who's going to be sending Jocker Wilnick into battle? Someone's going to be telling him where to go and who to kill. Unless I can get him to run for president. <laughs> well, go for it. Yeah, yeah. I remember last cycle, that was one of the options um, that, you know Brett Weinstein, right? Yeah. So he put that, I, uh, I forget what it was called, Freedom Party 2020. No. Or, I forget what it was called. Something, something, 2020. Uh, and yeah, I really, it was Jocko and somebody else. And I was like, yeah, I'd vote for that. <clears throat> I would vote for that. Yeah. But alas. Okay, so um, do you understand my position on trans? Because if you don't, the audience doesn't. And no, I understand your position. I just don't think that's what anyone's interested in. But I understand your position and agree with it and always have done. Got it. So I'm taking a reasonable position, but you know that the world is has already had that conversation and they completely reject it. That is my impression. I, I hope to be wrong. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know that belaboring that point will get us anywhere, but I will tie it real fast back to the whole reason that I want people to pay attention to the malleability of people is that we began this conversation with once you get obsessed with that, you have to understand what you're getting obsessed with is the breakdown of structure. Once you break down structure, mm. now you have a problem. In fact, the one last thing I will say on this. So in film school, they teach you that one immutable thing is true, and that is the constraints make for creativity. Mm -hmm. And that when you try to have no constraints whatsoever, things don't actually get better. They somehow end up getting worse. Mm -hmm. And I think that holds true for the vast majority of humanity, for, for all aspects of humanity. That doesn't mean, and this is why I find that the circle of, this is why I think that the circle of history, obviously not an exact circle, but comes very close to that because humans long to get free of those constraints and in times of stability, they can push back on that and they they find that, whoa, many of these things were freedoms that now that I have, my life is better and this is amazing. And so then you think more free is gonna be better and you push back on everything, 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 everything. And then it breaks and then you're, the strong man comes in and like reapplies structure and constraints and you can't do that. And, then you get out from under it as saying stabilize and freedoms, yay, and then freedoms break and then no freedoms and loop-de-loop -loop we go. Weak men create hard times. 
Hard mm-hmm. times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good yeah. times create weak men. And, yep. and around and around we go. On and on. But it's a spiral. We move up. And technology is a big part of that too. Mm. I mean, uh, for all our fears about AI, and I really know very little about it, I think that maybe it could be the end of us all. It could also be the saving grace that that comes in at exactly the right time and just solves some of this, some of these problems. I have a feeling it's going to play out like this. It right the moment you're living through right now, everybody. It's a tool, and if you're not using it, you are not long for this world. You will get passed by by the people that do use it. Can't stress that enough. I hope everybody on my team is listening. You know who you are. Some of you have adopted it, and some of you are being real fucking slow. And you're being slow because you think I'm going to fire you for uh, in replace you with AI, but I am not. I but I am going to expect you to be way more efficient now that you have AI. <laughs> Uh, so we are in the moment of tools. Use it as a tool. It will make your life so much better. Oh my God, the ways we've been able to deploy it are mind Same. bending. Saved us so much money. It's absolutely astonishing. Mm-hmm. Up to our quality. Uh, we put these out, these comedy monologues on our channel uh, that Francis and I do, and also monologues that I, my Substack pieces that I record and put out as videos. And the guy who edits them, he basically does the illustrations entirely through AI generated stuff that is amazing for creating things that illustrate the points that we're making comedically and otherwise. It's insane and what you can do with it. It's insane. And it's getting better by the second, not even by the day <laughs> or by the week. It's, it's unreal. Mm. The next phase is going to be uh, that it will look like it's ushering in the utopia because the tools will become so powerful. It will be unbelievable. But humans... For us, technology is the promise of a better future, and we always want a better future. And as long as anyone ever has a sick child or has to face their own mortality, they will keep pushing technology forward. And since that is true, I know that we will create artificial super intelligence. And once you have artificial super intelligence, that isn't. So I love running the math on this. So a moron is, but a literal moron is defined as somebody with like a 78 IQ, 78 to 81, something like that. It's right in there. Uh, that's, that's the literal definition of moron. Einstein was 162. So you're something like 2.3 X smarter or mm-hmm. 1.6, whatever the fucking math is. And very, uh, Einstein would know. Yeah. Yeah. He would know. And I wouldn't. And that shows you, uh, I'm a little too close to a moron. So, uh, it's less than three X mm. for sure. Mm-hmm. So artificial super intelligence is not going to be three times smarter than you or five times or 30 times or a hundred times or 3000 times or 3 million times. It's going to be a billion <coughs> times smarter than the other person. So if the difference between a moron and the atomic age and the person that gave us GPS and atomic weapons and atomic energy and all that uh, is whatever, less than three times better, what does the world look like when something is a billion times smarter than us? We, we are so inconsequential to them that if we can't align AI, we simply will accidentally cease to exist. Mm. What does it even matter, man? Like, honestly, if there was a, a type of bacteria that made the Everglades like 0.00001% more productive, do we care? Does it matter? No. And so that will be humans in the grand um, sense of the cosmos to a super intelligence. So now I have a whole thesis around, I don't think, my, my whole argument hinges on one base assumption. My base assumption is that desire is not a necessary part of intelligence. If it is, and that that superintelligence will want one thing over another thing, and it will move with rapidity to get that better thing, Mm. then the odds of us being aligned are effectively zero. That makes the base assumption that desire is an innate part of intelligence. If it is, then my argument doesn't work. But if it's not, then what we need to do is make sure that AI, as it developed towards superintelligence, does not care uh, life or death for itself, completely irrelevant. Um, get my goal, not get my goal, completely irrelevant. And so by default, I will move towards my goal. But if somebody tells me to stop, I will stop. Or if a certain set of criteria is met, I will stop. The problem is in the tool phase, you are going to have a human who cares very deeply about something. And that person will almost certainly imbue AI with a desire to accomplish his ends. And they will not realize the second and third order consequences of that is that you become irrelevant extraordinarily fast to something that you've now imbued with a desire to achieve its goals. So yeah, I think the, oh wow, this is weird. I can say this and just be distressingly blase about it. I think that it is inevitable that AI will happen and it is inevitable that our only hope is to uh, flee AI 
to the point where it doesn't care about us and is not trying to eradicate us. Sorry, not even trying to. It won't try to eradicate us. We will be the anthill to the superintelligence building a highway. Uh, as Elon <laughs> Musk says, no hard feelings. So just uh, this is what I have to put here. Mm. Um, but if we can get away from it, that's probably our only hope. That doesn't sound that optimistic. Super dark. The weird thing is I'm like really optimistic as a default, but I think that my optimism is just me leaning into uh, the the wonderful human ability to say, I know I'm going to die, but not today, even though I might die in like nine seconds. So it's probably something like that. But I don't see another way. Do you? I'm like just you, counting the seconds. You have, right? <laughs> you have a son. For yes. you, this shit is real as fuck. So what do you think? Like, are you on, like, burn AI to the ground. Stop building it. Is that your... Not possible. Not so po how do you, you think about it? You can't, you can't Luddite this shit. It's not going to happen. Cheers to that. So the only thing you can try to do... I mean, all of the sci-fi of my youth was wrestling with this question. The three laws of robotics, Asimov, all, of, all about this. And, and Did you read Dune? Uh, yes. Well, I don't remember it well. Dune but it, opens with, it is against the law to build a human-like intelligence. Yes. So you can't stop it, and that means we have to work with it one way or another. How that happens, I have no idea. I'm not nearly smart enough. It's not my area of expertise. I don't understand it well. Um, but we have never been able to suppress any technology, at least to the, as far as I know. Um, and so far, we have always learned to live with the technology that we've created. Now, eventually, we're going to invent one that we can't. Until then... There's no point thinking about it. I can't control that. I can't change that. All I can do is raise my son to be resilient for the world that's coming. I like that. Resilience is the punchline. It's one of a very small handful of things that people should optimize their life for if they're going to achieve fulfillment, which is really what I'm trying to help people do. Mm. <clears throat> um, give me resilience. What What is it? So we define power, define resilience. Most people spend their entire life trying to get other people to not fuck with them. And the answer is not to get other people not to fuck with you, it's to become unfuckable with. That's what you're trying to get to, where you are who you are and the world sort of flaps around you and you are going to your goal uh, undeterred by whatever else happens because you know where you're going. Uh, and resilience is the ability to deal with failure, to pick yourself back up when things go wrong, uh, to, I mean, I learned a lot about it from you, actually, and from our conversations, which it's about seeking feedback and reevaluating your starting positions. Uh, I, Ayn Rand uh, has a very interesting, you know, Ayn Rand is a great, uh, is a great author to read in your late teens. It's a kind of late teen philosophy that she has. Um, because well, it's overly simplistic? It's very idealistic, mm. extraordinarily idealistic. Uh, but one of the things she says that I really have taken on is whenever you think you're facing a contradiction, check your premises, one of them is wrong. And very often when you experience some kind of setback, the one premise that people don't check is, well, I did everything right, didn't I? Usually that is the premise that's incorrect. So resilience is being able to deal with what life throws at you and keep going. That's resilient. It's, it's the Rocky speech. What do you mean it's the Rocky speech? Remember when he's talking to his son? No. And he says life... Is this Rocky 3? I can't remember which Rocky it is, but he's, he's talking to his son in the street. And he says life, life will beat you down no matter how hard you are. But the question is, can you keep going? That's resilience. That's so good. I love that shit. I love that. I, boys and girls, get hard. Get tough. I think resilience, I wanna separate resilience and anti-fragility. But mm. for a second, I just wanna talk about resilience and Rocky IV, which I do remember. In Rocky IV- Is that the one with Ivan Drago? Yes. Oh, yes. The sexiest of them all <clears throat> was so incredible. Oh, that's right, because you're the bad Russian. Mm. Uh, but it was- I will concede he was hyper-masculine. He was hyper-masculine, <laughs> Dolph Lundgren, especially in that movie. Woo! Mm. <laughs> uh, but there was that whole idea of, I will break you. Mm. And he just was literally beating the shit out of Rocky. And the cool thing about Rocky is he's always the underdog. He always had to fight back and he could just take a beating and he just kept going. And I was, so I teach something called Impact Theory University. Mm. And I had a student today asking me and I started laughing and he was saying, I I'm trying so hard. 
and I just feel like I'm constantly hitting a wall. And he was like having this just like emotional turmoil. And I'm laughing. And I thought about like doing the laugh emoji in the Zoom call. And I thought he's not going to understand what I mean by that. And the reason that I was laughing is, yeah, that's what comes for all of us. My days feel exactly the same. I feel like I'm battering my head into a wall. I am failing at most of the things that I try. I'm running test after test after test after test. And I don't know if you feel a sense of ownership over Churchill because you're adopted British, but dude, Churchill, I know he's controversial. I love him. And one of my favorite quotes from him is success is the ability to go from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. And it's like, that is so true. Hmm. Like you're going to get kicked in the face over and over and over, like all the fucking time. It's unrelenting. And yet somehow you have to keep going. That is so anti-fragility. Hmm. I try to get everybody to build an anti-fragile personality. Mm -hmm. An anti-fragile personality is one where the more people attack you, the stronger you get. So if you're anti-fragile, the more punches you take, the stronger you get. The only way to do that is to, um, to emotionally reward yourself for being able to take punches. Mm. And once you're like, oh, it's my willingness to take the punch, to stare nakedly at my inadequacies, to pick myself back up, to wipe the blood off, to spit out my broken teeth, versus to never get hit or like, um, oh God, what's his name? Everybody, the boxer, uh, money. Floyd, Floyd, Floyd Mayweather. Floyd Mayweather, thank you. You're really coming to my rescue with all mm -hmm. these fighting uh, and sports people, thank you. Um, so people really began to hate him because his whole thing was, you just can't beat me. You and, can't hit me. Yeah, so his whole thing about like, <laughs> he wasn't like Tyson, everybody loved that fucking Tyson animalistic just broke you apart and i think people like his redemption arc uh but floyd the like i can't be hit there's nothing cool in that i can't relate to that i take punch after punch after punch so i want the guy that can take a punch and like he's battered and bloody but somehow manages to come back and when you can get hit and become more resilient with each punch then you've got the right set of ideas that you're building your personality around well i don't know if you caught on our channel we put <coughs> um we put an episode out uh about the future of trigonometry and we talked about the year that we've had today we nearly went bankrupt in january whoa um francis and i had a lot of stuff to work out personally and with each other mm. it was a really rough time and we made it through and now we're infinitely stronger you know and now the next phases of failure are coming. The stakes are getting higher. There's more money involved. There's more things that we're doing. We're building. We're expanding. Um, that's life. That's life. Things are going to go wrong all the time. Terrible things happen to everybody. And character is how you know when you react when, th when they happen. Mm. <clears throat> define character. Is it a set of values? Well, I just did define character. Character is, is how resilience. you react. Yeah. Well, so what's the right way to react then? <clears throat> well, it's hard to say because it really depends on what's happening, right? But the right, it sounds to me in terms of what you and I are talking about is the right way to react is to be stronger after whatever it is that happens. So I'll add a few more things to that. Mm -hmm. So integrity over everything. Yes. I'll define integrity. Agreed. If you said you're going to do it, do it. Agreed. Um, I mean, look, I guess you could say that Hitler had high integrity because, man, he fucking wrote in Mein Kampf exactly what he's going to do. And he fucking did it. And it was horrible, as horrible as something gets. Um, but I'll stick by that definition. You say Terrible people can have integrity. Osama bin Laden had incredible integrity. Yeah. So, oh, like he did watch porn, which is, I, I mean, I haven't really? read. Yeah, I, mean, I haven't. They found a stash of porn at his house. Seriously? When they, yeah, yeah. That is hilarious. Now, I haven't read my Quran cover to cover. But I'm guessing watching porn isn't in You're there. You're pretty sure that's, yeah. that wasn't yeah. in there. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, so, yeah, you say you're going to do it, do it. Mm. Uh, but then I'll add have honorable goals so that we can get rid of the Hitler problems. So you should be doing things that uplift not only <laughs> you, but those, the world at large. It's probably otherwise I'm going to get caught in another Hitler trap. Because uh, people around him, I'm sure for a while, are having a great time. You must uphold your people. Yeah. Oh, that gets problematic quick, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, very quick. Uh, hopefully people know what I mean, that you're trying to um, lead people towards human flourishing. Okay, so mm. uh, 
what else would I add to that? So willingness to stare nakedly or, or at your inadequacies, steering by the truth. In fact, we're now getting into, so we had the problematic beliefs uh, and then I have a new set of rules that I'm gonna propose. Mm -hmm. So just to wrap up the problematic <laughs> beliefs, um, tearing it down versus incremental improvement, mm -hmm. which I think uh, people think that something will be rebuilt from the ashes, That that is foolish and dangerous. Uh, and there is a reason that societies have structure and that we all say we're standing on the shoulders of giants. So be careful. Um, it's a, it's a harder one to talk about though, I think, because this country was built of revolution, tearing it down. What do you mean? What do you, what do you mean? What do I mean? This country is the product of a revolution. Revolu I thought you said evolution. No, revolution. So I was like, huh? No. Ooh. Okay. So <laughs> I would posit yeah. that it was built on revolution, but it was not built on tearing everything down. And in fact, there's mm. a reason that um, Churchill rightly said that America, even though America had displaced, I mean, he didn't, he, he was born in the 1800s. So he was like, not that far removed from England was really the shit. And he certainly was at the height of the British Empire, was there as it declined. And he was like, America is sort of the right, rightful heir mm. of this set of ideas mm -hmm. that should not be owned by any one country. Mm. And I always thought that was, for all of the horrible things, um, I think that that's the right way to think about it. And I think that America really pushed back at a time of like, hey, you say these are your ideals, mm -hmm. but you're not living up to them. Mm -hmm. And so not only are we gonna try to up live up to them, we're gonna try to improve upon them. And so it does feel to me like America is standing on the shoulders of the the British approach sure. to self-governance, the individual um, uh, case law. Uh, we're gonna to get to that, yeah, which yeah. is my understanding no, of the, it The fast, French but... and Russian revolutions were a lot more revolutionary. I uh, agree. Yeah. <clears throat> I yeah. agree. So, uh, so... Don't tear everything down. Yeah, you, one ought to be very careful about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, we've touched on masculinity, so I won't beat it to death, but masculinity view, masculinity and aggression viewed as toxic because if we have any entrepreneurs out there, I would just like to say, uh, as in the immortal words of my high school cheer squad, be aggressive, be, be <laughs> aggressive. Mm -hmm. You need to be aggressive. That doesn't mean uh, to drop integrity. It doesn't mean to be unethical. It means to be aggressive. You need to be aggressive. Uh, fiscal irresponsibility is probably, uh, my audience will love to hear me talk about that because that's economy, but probably oh, a different interview. Uh, I mean, sure, but th that that is something I've been talking you, about. I've been talking- more. I've not seen your interviews on the economy. What you got for me? Well, I don't think it's gonna be anything new. But I've been saying I love old. since 2008, like we've ent emptied the medicine cupboard and we are not ready for the next one. In fact, this is how the cycle of spending and borrowing has always worked historically. You create a surplus in times of peace, war comes, you spend that surplus, you acc accumulate debt, then you pay it off and you build up a surplus in times of peace again. Uh, we don't have wars as much, although we do. But, you know, pandemic, financial crisis, these things always come along. And you have, I mean, it's kind of basic economics, basic household situation. And, and then somebody comes along and goes, oh, we've got this cool new thing called modern monetary theory, which is basically just code for we can print as much money as we want. Well, that runs out fast. And eventually reality, you know, we always talk, you and I have always talked about the clash with reality. Mm. And by the way, people don't realize this, but it's one of the main complaints that the the Chinese and the Russians and the others have about Western um, behavior. It's not just territorial or in any other way. They're like, you're printing money, which affects us because you're buying our goods with your increasingly devalued money. And we are the ones that suffer. This is not a sustainable situation. And you talked about my son. We are borrowing, we are borrowing money to spend on things we can't afford and indebting our grandchildren who are not yet born. It is immoral, it is financially irresponsible, and it's gonna to lead to disaster if we don't stop it. Yeah, this is where uh, the set of ideas that we pass along culturally becomes so critically important, but also since I think, I, I don't think there is a way to stop it. Mm. And I certainly invite anybody to show me that I'm wrong. But the, the approach that I took to preparing for this episode was recognizing that, look, empires are gonna collapse. 
look, the collapse of the U.S. is it is inevitable. Now, whether it happens in the next five years, 50 years, 500 years, that I don't know. Historically, it's probably in the 50 to 100 year range. It'll happen slowly enough that for the most part, like if you're alive, you're you're able to take advantage of it, but you have to understand the game. And so one of the things, because again, I, I just I think at the individual level, one of the things you have to understand is you have to re-up your context. So if you were trying to play a game of chess, but you were never looking at the board, sure, like if you're so good that you don't even need to know what your opponent is doing because you just like are able to guess. But I mean, realistically, even the grand chess masters look at the board, they understand where we are, they understand what your opponent is doing. And so people need to go, okay, where are we? What is the cycle? Where are we in the cycle? What does that mean? And how do I inoculate myself against mm -hmm. it? Now, the problem is that getting the timing right is virtually impossible. And having the right idea with the wrong timing is the same as having the wrong idea. And so that was, I transitioned into really thinking about the economy and world events and all that stuff, because I saw what happened in 2020. And I was like, people are going to get obliterated. Now, I didn't understand printing of money yet. And I didn't understand how we were socializing losses. But now, once you understand that they're printing money, then you have to have a strategy for that. So you have to be watching the board, understanding how the context is changing, updating your thinking. So I had the really surreal experience of uh, Ray Dalio comes on the show, he writes his books, and he keeps saying all the matters is how people are with each other. And that one of the things anybody needs to do if you want to have a strategy to navigate all weather, uh, war, peace, um, your country is the dominant power, your country is the declining power, whatever. Like if you want to navigate all of this well, you have to understand um, what, what it boils down to is how people are with each other. I didn't understand what he meant by that. And he kept saying how people are with each other. Wah. And I bump into him backstage in Dubai. And Everything is, and this wasn't that long ago. So everything's very unstable and I'm starting to get unnerved and I, a lot of people moving to Dubai and I'm just like, huh. I meet him backstage and I'm like, oh, wow, Ray, like seeing you in Dubai, like, uh, you know, I'm, oh, I come to the Middle East a lot. And I'm like, say more. <laughs> Why do you come to the Middle East a lot? And he was just like, you know, there's so much going on here and things are really popping off and they've done an extraordinary job here and in, um, in Malaysia and he spent a lot of time in China. And so he's just laying out like, he did not say, I wanna be very clear. He didn't say like, oh, I need to make sure that I have places that I can go if America ends up not being the place to be, but you can start connecting the dots with this whole idea of there's a ton of division in America. Uh, there's instability with America as probably a declining power. China as a rising power, instability elsewhere in the world. And it's like, you need to be able to, um, go to different places if that's where you need to bounce. And that was one of those, it's part of the game I would say I'm weakest at. I'm very rooted in California, mm -hmm. um, which makes me extraordinarily nervous in terms of a place that has embraced ideas that sound good, but are not delivering quality results as somebody that's been here for 30 years. I'm just like, bro, forget me. I've thrived. I've done nothing mm. but thrive. I look around me mm. and I'm like, yo, the policies are not working unless you're like me and you've made just ridiculously outsized wins. And so, yeah, that doesn't seem like a winning strategy. So that's one of the ones that I'm very slow to react to. I'll be very honest. I don't ever want to have to leave LA. I don't ever want to have to leave America. Um, but I do want people to be realistic about what the chessboard says. And the chessboard says what the chessboard says. And you need to play based on what you see. Let me ask you why you think this isn't going to get fixed. Okay, so... Because <laughs> I, I have a theory on that, but I want to hear yours. All right, so I think that humans are the way humans are. Mm -hmm. The brain works in a certain way, and these cycles have run in cycles forever because we only have, there's only so many, like even if we're a hundred sided die, a hundred dice with 20 sides each, and we're all a roll, that's still only so many personalities and we react to each other uh, in very specific ways. And we probably break into only so many clusters of personality types. I'll peg it, random guess, but that there's, let's say 30 groupings of what people are like. And so it's like, okay, well, those 30 people are only gonna react in so many different ways. Then there's only so many possible uh, economy static, economy rising, economy declining, um, uh, war, stability, um, lost war, won war. Like there's only so many situations. And so this really does become pretty predictable. Ray Dalio again has broken it down into six phases. It's tied to the debt cycle or the business cycle. And as you start walking through it, it's like, yeah, they're not identical for sure but it's 
pretty predictable. So he did this whole breakdown of the last uh, 500 years. He looked at really closely. And then he looked at a much higher level, I think like the last 2000 years. So he was like, yeah, it just repeats over and over and over. And when I look at it's the same thing that I feel with AI, I just look at what humans are like. And when the group starts overtaking individual think, it, it only ends in one way and that's violence. And there's, I think out of the last eight times that we've been declining power, rising power, uh, debt, like all the things that are true right now, six of the eight times it's ended in war. And so it doesn't always end in war, but most of the time. But what is the mechanism by which people refuse to address that problem? Why is it? What are the incentive structures? The, Do you remember? The, yeah, the incentive structure is I want my life to be prosperous right now. I'm going to elect anyone that promises me that things will be prosperous. The way that they do that is debt and printing money. You can only take on so much debt and print so much money before something happens. It's typically a pandemic or war. And that breaks the back. Like you said, the medicine cabinet's empty and we got sick again. So uh, we have no money remaining because we've been spending in foreign wars and uh, printing our way out of 2008, printing our way out of COVID. And so now it's like, okay, if, so I'm gonna make a hypothesis. I, I'm, I'm not the thinker to listen to on this. I just want people to understand how I approach novel problems. So um, I'm looking at this moment and I say, okay, what, what I understand about things is um, when you print money too much, you just increase inflation. That when you have, we added a trillion dollars of debt in a month. In a month, dude, we only have $33 trillion in debt. So like if you're adding, that in a month, like th this is bad. And this is times of like, everything's okay, but we're sending billions of dollars in aid to foreign wars. We just had another war pop off with another ally. Like, what are we gonna do? I have no idea what we're gonna do, but I start looking at that and I'm like, if I hate America and I'm just looking at the chessboard and I'm playing to win and I'm, let's say China is the most logical example. And I'm looking at that and I'm like, I'm playing to win. I see a weakness in here. And PS, most of the war is always gonna fought, be fought surreptitiously. So I'm gonna start doing my belt, road and belt or belt and suspenders, whatever the fuck it's called. Belt and, and road. Belt and road, thank you. So I'm going around, belt I'm investing. Belt and suspenders is a whole yeah, different thing, Different, different thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm going around and I'm investing in all these different countries to make sure that I have allies that that wanna um, you know, work with me, uh, that are basically invested in um, my policies, my influence in the region, and look, of course, China has its own problems. And I'm, as an American, I'm counting on that, hobbling them enough that it's sort of everything balances out <clears> and <throat> that there isn't some runaway train where everything's great for China and we're too weak. But that's, that's the power dynamic. So I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, hmm, if China takes a stance on Israel-Palestine, I'm going to be very curious to see what the posture is. And again, if I can believe what I saw in X today, their stance is that um, Israel is, has gone too far and this is no longer defense. That can be read. Again, I'm not the person to go listen to Ian Bremmer. He's going to be a far, far wiser voice on all this than I am, uh, or Ray Dalio for that matter. But I'm going to guess that it's playing out something like this. That's a shot across the bow for America to say, hey, America, not the thing to back. We think they need to be to back off. If you keep saying, yeah, 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 they should be defending themselves, then okay, one, we think that you're overextending. We're letting you know how we think about this. We're watching to see how far that goes, how tied up in that you goes, what other areas in the region pop off. If obviously Iran, I think, made a public statement where they're like, ah, oh, like we don't wanna see this go anywhere, which would be awesome. But like this, this is the chessboard. So China wants to see how tangled does America get into that? They're obviously not for Israel going any harder. Are they gonna get involved? Are they not? Who knows, we'll see. But if that's them setting the stage for them to, move something forward with Taiwan, that those are the pieces moving around the chessboard that makes me go, okay, uh, what do I do if this really does escalate into a world war, a true global, global conflict? What are the different players looking for and how do I position myself to um, not get mauled by all of this and to ideally 
actually be able to take advantage of the opportunities. Now, I can't tell you, I, I would not trust myself enough to be the purveyor of the news of what to do in that. I'm the person I trust to say, this is how you need to think through the novel problem. Mm -hmm. You need to be resilient. You need to understand that opportunities are gonna open up. You need to have enough dry powder that you're able to take advantage of that, which means that you have to be fiscally responsible. And so anybody that's telling you to just spend, 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 and we can print money forever, that is not a person you want to listen to. That's somebody that's going to get overextended and out over their skis. So I try to be really honest with myself and others about the part you can listen to me on and the part where you need to go find somebody smarter. So getting this sort of geopolitical landscape, don't know. I'm, I'm listening to other people. But understanding how to have the mental and financial fortitude to have an all-weather strategy, yeah, that... I've, I've got a take on that. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the incentives to me are very, very simple. People don't want to don't want to reduce their quality of life now, even if it means impoverishing their grandchildren, which to me is one of the most horrific and irresponsible things we can do as a society. But that is exactly what we've been doing. And, and will do. And, and will continue to do. I don't see a way to stop. I don't either, because I don't know if you have this conversation here in the US, but in the UK, it's like, what, you want to reduce public spending? That's killing people. That, that's the moronic level at which we have the conversation. It doesn't go any further than that. Yeah. Do you think that's a problem? I think that that is the current language around the forever thing, which is what you just said. I don't want to reduce the quality of my life. And 15 years is a long time to punt. And maybe it's not 15, maybe it's 50. Mm -hmm. And so since I don't know the timing and can't get it right, yeah, I'll punt. So print money, uh, take out debt, uh, I heard back in the 80s, we had trillions of dollars of debt. It's not a problem. It's all good. And the bad news is, and this falls into the same category of thing as the malleability thing, where it's like, you can really get away with bad thinking for a long fucking time. Yeah. And so it's like, is it bad thinking? Or is the world going to get a clown on me in 10 years because I was wrong? And I mean, I can assure you, <laughs> I don't, I, I'm so confident that I'm right about be resilient understand human nature, find your way to ground truth, be a prediction engine, but we'll see. Only the fullness of time will tell. So what do we do with that? What, how do you, do you have a strategy for unwinding this? It's gonna sound very naive after everything you've said, but it's, it tell the truth. Tell the truth, change the culture, you know, in terms of Look at the way that this format has changed the way we communicate. The media empires of the future are going to be built in the next 10 years. And it's going to look like something like this. Podcasters coming together under one umbrella or various media outlets being formed from new media. This is the future, what we're doing here. Did that, you know that the Daily Wire made $200 million last year? I didn't know that, but it doesn't surprise me. Bro. Those guys are kicking ass. Bro. I was like, God damn. Yeah, yeah. So I'm Trigger Media is going to be th the next $200 million company. <laughs> we'll see about that. It's harder to do in the UK. So it might be a 50 million pound company. Or, you might to, move start to the US. Or we might move to I the US over way. time. You're right, exactly. Uh, but that's what I want to do. Uh, and part of the reason I want to do that, the main reason I want to do that isn't to make $200 million. It's to change the way we have these conversations. I thought you were going to say a billion dollars. <laughs> well, like this chump change is $200 million yeah. bullshit. You know, trigonometry and what we do has always been mission driven first. Mm. Uh, and it's I know the that only way to make the money. I'll just tell you that right now. Really? Yes. Why is it, that? It is so fucking hard. Mm. The only thing I guarantee you said it earlier, new fights are coming your way. The stakes are getting higher. The more money you make, Mo money, mo problems. <laughs> that shit is so fucking real, dude. Mm. Like, that is just so real. So success is a game of attrition. I have to find a cooler way to say that. Everybody gives up. Everybody gives up. Really? Yes. That's Why? it. Uh, th name a podcaster. They're going to give up. Joe Rogan will get so rich one day he's just gonna be like, I don't fucking want to deal with this anymore. He's gonna quit. The the he number loves doing it though. I I use him only as an example. He's right. fucking amazing. And off camera, you and I were saying, I think he's the GOAT. And look, I want it to be me. I want to beat him. I'm in this every day to beat Joe Rogan. But I want to acknowledge the man is fucking amazing. He's killing it. He has set the bar, bar very high. But ultimately, I've just, there the number of um, 
now save me from Warren Buffett. I was gonna, you have to name all the basketball players and all the, mm -hmm. the money guys. Warren Buffett, uh, it, that's rare. That you get somebody that keeps playing the game at mm -hmm. that level, dealing with those kind of headaches for that long. So yeah, people give up. The stats around companies that scale are terrifying. It's something like, these are directionally correct, though not specifically accurate. 90% uh, of all companies fail to get to a million dollars. 99.8% of all companies fail to get to 10 million. It, it is vanishingly slim, the number of companies that do $10 million in revenue, because one, you have to have the right ideas, but two, you have to weather so many storms and so much boredom, people will quit. This is why, to me, it's, it's a, a set of ideas that turn you into an anti-fragile mm. warrior for your cause. And so when it gets hard, and your revenue's declining, the world's making fun of you. You made a real mistake and it really cost you money. Mm. And Francis is rightfully upset with you. Mm. And your kid has a fucking choir practice mm. or a recital, it's a choir recital. And if you go to that choir recital, mm. you will lose a million dollar deal. Mm. What the fuck do you do? The vast majority of humanity, one, they just can't face that they really fucked up mm. and that their business partner has a right to be mad at them. They can't deal with uh, missing their kids. Bamper. It's not worth it to them. They don't want to miss it. And so they go do that thing and they justify it and they say, this is more important. Mm. And maybe it is. Maybe I'm the fucking madman. Mm -hmm. But they go to that thing. And when they go to that thing, I don't. I'm a fucking machine. Mm. I didn't even have kids. And that person goes, Tom, you're wasting your life. You don't even know what joy is. Cool. I'm still going to eat your fucking lunch. Mm. And so maybe I will be on my deathbed crying myself to sleep. But remember, I'm the guy saying it's about impact. Mm. It's about who you're fighting for. Mm. But because I show up every day fighting for people, humans, mm. people that I know and love and can visualize. And dude, now I've been at this long enough because remember, the thing that is now Impact Theory University used to be Quest University. And so I've been at this game for well over a decade, 12 years, 13 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. So I've got fucking students that are like, bro, I built this multi-million dollar business. I can't thank you enough, bro. I'm making $150,000 and I never thought that I would make more than minimum wage. Like person after person after person after person. I know these fucking ideas work. Mm -hmm. So because I'm doing it for those people, I don't quit. Mm -hmm. If I wasn't doing it for those people and I was just doing it for the fucking money, why would I keep doing it? That's I've already true. got money. That's a good point. Uh, that makes sense to me. So yeah, Trigger Media is mission driven, always has been, always will be. And I think we have an opportunity to change. The medium is the message. This is a different medium to the way that this conversation has been had up to now. This is an opportunity to get the truth out. This is how a lot of people are now getting educated about what the world is and what's happening. You are not going to hear this conversation on Fox News or CNN or MSNBC or anywhere else, right? And quality over time will win, I think. Uh, so I believe that we have to get these ideas out there and then we'll see, can we change that culture or not? Uh, that remains to be seen, but the media of the, the media empires of the future are going to be built in the next 10 years. There's no question about that for me. Um, and we're going to build one of them. It's incredible. I love that you have a mission. The mission, I think, revolves around changing culture. Is that specifically how you see it? Like yes. we have to get the ideas out there. Yes. So if you had to boil Trigger Media down to one core idea, because I have a feeling this is going to feed into my new set of rules here. Um, what is the core idea that you think needs to be injected into society? And if it's truth, give me what truth or how do you define that? Is it the ability to predict? Like, uh, what's the core idea you want to? It's inject funny in that culture? you prefaced it with that. The, the idea is truth matters. Okay. Truth matters, and yeah, I mean, you you say it all the time: the ability to predict the outcome of your actions or to predict the future based on what you're saying, right? Mm. Accuracy about the future. Um, and more broadly, you and I have talked about this many times and including in this conversation, it's about taking ideas that work and rejecting ideas that don't. If we start there, we have a lot of work to do in our society right now. Let's start with that. Let's clear out all this bullshit about, oh, this makes me feel good, therefore it's true. If we start there, we're going to make a hell of a lot of impact on society based on what Thomas Sowell's, that Thomas Sowell quote, the last 50 years have been spent exchanging what, what sounds good for what works. Mm. Let's switch that around. Let's make the next 50 years about switching what sounds good for what works and see what comes out on the other end.
Okay. So you will be unsurprised to hear that that is uh, on my list of things. So just to reorient everybody to the structure of the conversation, my goal in all of this was to figure out, okay, as empires decline, why do we get obsessed with gender? I thought the punchline would be what it is, which is we pull a lot of the threads. Mm. We're all sort of pushing back on this idea of you're putting constraints on me. I don't want any constraints, not biology, not anything. Uh, and ironically, before I knew the culture war even existed, I was trying to convince people you're having a biological experience, not realizing that was going to become a battleground. Um, so in that context, so we've just gone through like what the bad ideas are. Um, and I'm sure it's the tip of the iceberg, but, and, and I'm going to run through them really fast and then we'll get into this new set of ideas. So the problematic ideas that I think cause the collapse of any civilization, any empire, uh, Rome included, and I, I literally watched a bunch of documentaries on the collapse of Rome uh, specifically for this, and th this is exactly what you see. So you've got um, people start to believe that prosperity is a fundamental law of nature that's just gonna happen and they take it for granted. Uh, they begin to believe that the group owes the individual versus the individual owing the group. And so the group begins to um, basically take away from the individual so they can distribute to the group. A little counterintuitive, but that's the um, inversion that happens. Uh, begin to believe that redistribution is the miracle instead of prosperity, being this hard fought thing that you cannot take for granted. Uh, they start to believe that everything is a social construct, that there's no ground truth, that we can push back against nature. It, it doesn't have any fundamental laws. Uh, diversity of values of the same team is inherently good. We actually didn't talk about that, um, but to encapsulate it quickly so that we can get onto the, the good stuff. Um, again, to quote Thomas Sowell, <laughs> nothing has ever been taken as fact without uh, so little, little evidence as diversity being our greatest um, advantage. And he went on to say that diversity is not by default an advantage. Diversity is the thing that we have to overcome. I'll say that I think to keep that comment from becoming pathologized, it's really diversity of values mm -hmm. that are the problem. Ironically, you want a diversity of approach. You want different mindsets. So you want uh, visionaries and executors, which will always have friction between them. You want um, men and women in a marriage is a great example. You need the friction between them to raise a child well. Uh, <laughs> but diversity of values, I think, is problematic. So at Impact Theory, we have a set of values that I publish and I say, hey, here, here is the culture at Impact Theory. If you don't like this, um, this is not the place for you. Mm -hmm. And we will not hire somebody that does not share those values. So, but whether they're male, female, gay, straight, man, woman, li I, black, white, China, could not care less. Mm -hmm. uh, I care not at all for whether we end, like if, if this company ends up being all black women, I'm here for it. As long as we share values and we have all the different idea sets and they'll challenge each other and challenge power and all that stuff, word. Um, so we happen to have a diverse group visually, but we didn't hire for that. Mm -hmm. We hired entirely for, do we share values and will, will you buy into competing, um, based on meritocracy and ideas? Uh, don't tear it all down. Uh, sorry. They start to believe to tear it all down is better than incremental improvement. Masculinity and, and aggression is toxic, becomes all about, uh, spending money, racking up debt, printing money. Okay, now the new set of rules. Um, I'll run through them quickly, and then you tell me which one you want to dive into. So I think people need to seek self-correcting structures. Mm -hmm. I'll call that the American experiment. So it's uh, ideas that force itself to spiral upward. Mm -hmm. um, you have to want dynamic tension between opposing forces. So left, right is mm -hmm. the, the easiest one. You have to want there to be a left and a right. Mm -hmm. You have to want that dynamic tension. I have evolutionary reasons why I think that's true. Um, I believe that everybody should have the North Star of human flourishing. Um, you have to steer by results. So if our North Star is human flourishing, that we're, we try something, but if it didn't work, we have to admit that it didn't work and try something else. You need to reward merit, even though it will yield inequality because some people are just smarter and better than others. I fucking wish that wasn't true because there are so many people that are smarter than me. Uh, freedom of speech, absolute cornerstone. You have to seek disconfirming evidence, which is part of why you need freedom of speech. Uh, you need to reinstitute rule of law. I actually heard a really interesting story from your partner, Francis Foster, uh, who said one of the things that was a hallmark of Venezuela was they started to not impose 
um, punishments because that was right where right wing authoritarianism. And so he, he was like, it became the Myrtle capital of the world mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of other horrific things. Uh, so you do need to reinstitute rule of law. So going back to this idea of we've pulled all these threads of the sweater and it's now falling apart, you need structure. And in the constraints is the creativity um, so I think that's important. And then overhauling education so that everyone is trained in useful ideas so that they can maximize whatever skills and talents they do have. So even though it will be unequal, there's no reason that the, the idea starting line, because our talents, unfortunately, will always be unequal, mm. uh, but that the idea starting line can't be equalized, especially with the fucking internet. Go to YouTube, the smartest people in the world, and I will not count myself among them, but the smartest people in the world are giving their best ideas away as fast as they can fucking talk on any subject you can possibly imagine, all for free. All you have to do is be able to access the internet. Uh, and P.S., if your country is clamping down on the internet, that's a red fucking flag. Mm. Agree with all of that. Any, it's all great. Any you want to add? No, that, I, I think that you nailed it exactly. All right, so let's, exactly. let's go into them. Which, which do you think are most important? I think they're all super important. It's like saying which of your legs is more important. I think you have to rank order. My right leg is more important than my left. Is it? Yes. Why do people... So you are fucking smart. Why is your initial reaction to not want to rank order things? I find... In fact, now I'm going to talk to you. You're a budding entrepreneur. Yeah. My friend, you will have to get fiercely good at rank ordering everything agreed who's who's better you or or francis uh at what of course it will be different at different things but you're going to need to know on everything that matters which one of us is better agreed. who are your best employees uh, again along different dimensions what tasks should you do first you you can't do two things at once i'm pretty good at that at this point I, I, I have so I now have a lot to improve you're going to rank order these fucking things okay or at least i'll give, give you two answers one will sound glib because i can't remember all of them okay fair number Would you one. like to look at them uh could do uh number two i do think sometimes it's like it's the new rules section yes um the but it's also like what is more important to bake a cake flour or a bowl well you kind of need flour a bold bad example. Uh, no, flour. It, I'm or... going to be a dick and just keep doing that. <laughs> of course, I understand your point. Your point you is need taken. Everything. But I, I, yes, I do though think that people create a certain okay. amount of paralysis. All right, for themselves. all right, all right. Fine. To stop you being a dick. There you go. Well, I, I fucking can't. Okay, steer by results. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's obviously super important. But can you steer by results if there's no rule of law? If there's fucking people running around stealing shit all around you? I mean, you can try. But without yeah. the rule of law. So I'll I'll give you the steer by results to me is the ground truth, Agreed. which you said is the thing that you're trying to do. I think you've already got it. Yeah. With the truth is ultimately the only thing that's going to take you where you want to go. Yeah. So I think there's stuff in here that follows from that. If you steer by results, you will necessarily reward merit, even though it creates inequality. Mm. Right. That that so you can cut that one out, actually. You just need to steer by results. Then that is a natural process. Okay, it's interesting. There's something happening between the two of us. There's our worldviews are colliding right now. Oh, hello. And I, I don't know if it matters. And so I'll touch on it briefly and see if okay. it seems like it's going to go somewhere interesting. Um, I I run into this. I think that the, th the very thing that makes me a good entrepreneur mm -hmm. is that I am willing to speak in binaries and rank order everything. Okay. And I think people get lost in the that everything is interconnected because that is true mm -hmm. and it will also fuck you up. Why? Because you'll get lost in the complexity and you won't boil things down to what do I do with the next 15 minutes of my life? Mm. And ultimately, this is the reason that the vast, 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 vast majority of companies never make it to a million dollars oh. is the person... Um, doesn't understand the physics of progress. And what the physics of progress forces you to do is accept that you have imperfect knowledge, but you must act as if you have perfect knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then as you act with your imperfect knowledge, you, so I'll explain it this way. You have two jobs. Job number one is to intoxicate your team with certainty mm -hmm. because otherwise you can't galvanize a bunch of people, which you said, the alpha male is the one that can create unity amongst the group. Okay, the only way to do that is to give them certainty. Agreed. Uh, if you can, 
oh my God, your Oxford speech. Mm -hmm. You said, let me tell you what Xi Jinping is doing. The only way he's going to stay in power is if he gives people the one thing they want, which is prosperity. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, cool. We know that there are going to be certain ideas that were, they're actually going to move the needle. They're going to move people forward and they're going to be ideas that are not. So we're going to be in this loop of, I'm going to intoxicate people's certainty. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you prosperity. I'm going to promise it and cool. But if Xi Jinping is actually going to be successful, he has to go. Is this zero COVID policy working? Mm. People are starting to riot mm. a lot. I don't mm. like this. I'm going to adjust. So he has to have some mechanism by which he's checking himself. So I've told everybody, you know, hey, everybody, without question, as if it were divine statement, zero COVID. And then it's like, oh shit, it's not leading to prosperity. I'm gonna check that. I'm seeking disconfirming evidence. Okay, fuck, this isn't working. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna adjust. And hey, everybody, as if I never said this other thing, zero COVID is stupid. And now we're gonna unlock and we're gonna open. So you have to intoxicate people with certainty and you have to constantly check yourself to see if that's actually true mm -hmm. and update your thinking. Mm -hmm. And so it is very difficult to do but people that can't do it, and most people can't because they're so lost in, oh, but it's all interconnected and all of these things are important. Yes, motherfucker, I understand that, but you have to do a thing. And mm -hmm. PS, you have to tell people what thing they should be doing. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't tell people, we're doing this, mm -hmm. and my best guess of how to get there is this, so go do that. Mm -hmm. And then by the way, your employees are gonna push back on you. Mm -hmm. They're going to fucking test you and they're going to see, are you the right alpha or should I be running this company? Mm -hmm. Because there is one immutable truth. If you're anything like me, and unfortunately I'm, I'm not Steve Jobs enough to just be like, look, asshole, this is fucking awesome. What you just said is dog shit. Go do what I said, which apparently is literally how he talked. Uh, I can't do that. So I'm not smart enough to have all the right answers. Mm -hmm. So I have to, I have to let people challenge me. But if I'm not the right person to lead, mm. now we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So I have to let them challenge me, but I have to squash rebellion. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this is what happens to people. They get so lost. Oh, maybe you really are right. That they are not like, no, we're not fucking doing that. Thank you. I heard your arguments. I steel man their arguments. So I know they understood. And when they're right, I just go, you're right. Mm -hmm. Boom. We're instituting that immediately. Mm -hmm. But if it's, I think the wrong thing. And now... They're high in their own supply because maybe their last three ideas I implemented right away. Mm. They're like, no, 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 Tom, you don't understand. I've got to be able to squash that rebellion. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I've got no problem doing any of that. Word. But yeah. this comes down to being able to say this fucking thing is the thing we well, need to do the, right the, now. The, the, the slogan is that I say to all our team is the only reason we're all here is we care about the outcome. This isn't about you, Mission it's not driven. about me, it's not about France, it's not about anybody, it's about the outcome. Smart. If what you're doing is furthering that outcome, great. If what you're doing is not furthering that outcome, we don't want to hear. Yeah. Simple as that. Um, steer by results is basically that, right? So to me, that's number one. <clears throat> Seeking disconfirming evidence seems to me to be part of that too, right? Because that is what you have to do. How do you do that in your life? Ste uh, seek disconfirming evidence. Mm -hmm. You know, probably not well enough because I wait for life to slap me in the face. And then I'm like, oh, shit. Okay, that wasn't good. It's interesting. You have a persona that makes me nervous. I could never adopt your persona, which I get is a reflection of who you really are. But on Twitter, like you go hard on people. And I'm always like, mm, I'm too afraid I'm going to change my mind. Like two weeks from now when I get better evidence mm. that I'm way more gentle um, it depends what you're talking about, though. I don't think you're going to change your mind about the fact that meritocracy is superior to diversity artificially created. I have a high degree of confidence on that. Me too. Correct. And that's why I go hard at people who try to substitute one for the other. So you only go hard on the things that you're already like super high confidence. And then if I don't know about something, I don't say anything about it. Yeah. However... I somebody was uh, trying to make me look bad this morning on Twitter by bringing up something I said at the very beginning of COVID and presenting it out of the historical context. Mm. Right. I said some things at the beginning of COVID that I don't agree, didn't agree with by the end of COVID. But what people forget is it was a completely different situation at the beginning to the one at the end. Right. You know, the first lockdown I supported, I still would. I, if, it, if it were to happen again without prior knowledge of what happened this time, I'd be like, yeah. Let's let's see what happens here. Let's be careful. We don't know what this is. Um, but generally, I only try, I, I try very, very hard and increasingly harder and harder as my audience gets bigger 
to only talk about the things on which I have a high level of confidence. How do you update your thinking then? Let's say that you are supremely confident about mm -hmm. something. How do you maintain the stability? So we've been talking a lot about structures necessary. Mm -hmm. So you need a scaffolding of your thinking. These yeah. things are the, the, the things that I hold to be true. Um, how do you open your mind to something challenging, a structural belief, uh, so that you don't become dogmatic, but at the same time have a stable belief system that you're willing to defend? I don't think I, I've thought about it structurally and analyzed how I do that. Um, I listen to the people around me a lot. I don't always agree with them. And I like, I what I really, really like is having smart people around me who I disagree with. Like one of my really good friends that I've become very good friends with lives, lives here in LA. When I go around to her house, all we do is argue, but we both really enjoy it. In like a fun way? Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. And and we have a great time and you know we love each other and whatever, but but we disagree on a lot because we have different perspectives and we enrich each other and we both say, I need you, you know? So I like being surrounded by people who don't agree with me. Uh, it's why Francis and I work so well, because we're completely different people with different perspectives, different political views, different backgrounds, etc. Uh, and the rest of our team are very different people as well. Let me challenge my own idea. Do you guys hold the similar value sets? Of course, they won't map one to one, but do you hold similar value sets or even the values you guys are? No, we different? have very similar value sets. Yeah. 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 I think that will play out over yeah. time. Hard work. Um, defiance. Defiance? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. We needed that to start. We are, we're phasing that out over time. Hmm. But we need it. We why? Had to, why because, phase it out? Uh, why phase it out? Because it's, a, it's, a, it's an oppositional posture that we don't need. You're saying to the brand or to your personality? Uh, look, to, maybe we're misusing words here. What I mean is when we started, we were like, fuck you. Yeah. And now we're like, we don't need to be fuck you because we're, we've are we grown so much mm. that we're not, we're the mainstream now. It reads different. Yeah. When you're a yeah. big guy yeah. saying fuck you. Yeah. yeah, it reads completely different. And we don't need it. It's like, we used to be like, well, the mainstream media, is, and now we have a bigger audience than a lot of the mainstream media do. So it's kind of like, why, why would we be talking about them? Let's just do our own shit. Let's make great content, you know? Um, so that would be one. Uh, integrity. Integrity has always been number one for us. You know, how do you treat people in your life? How do you treat, you know, how do you treat your staff? How do you treat women? All of this stuff. These are all like big red flags for me. When I see somebody who's who's different in that way, I'm like, I'm staying well away from this person, you know. Um, so integrity initially was defiance, uh, resilience. Every time something goes wrong, we're like, okay, how do we get around this? Okay, cool, cool, cool. No, 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 I get it. It's bad. How do we get around this? Mm. You know, um, I'm trying to think what else. And we like to have a lot of freedom of opinion. People are allowed to express dissent or disagreement or whatever, as long as they know that having heard that, we're making the decision, mm. you know, which is what you talked about earlier. Um, haven't had dissent, uh, haven't had the rebellion anyway. Um, but we'll deal with that when it comes. I look forward to that. Yeah, it's uh, running a company is is the ultimate test. It is you're up against the market. You're the best thing about running a company is the people in the company. Yeah. The worst thing about running a company is the people in the company. Yeah. And it's so funny how they'll all have life drama just like staggered. So just when you think like, okay, everybody's back on task now, then the next person, and it, it, I mean, when you have a, a group of people that are together for a long time, I mean, you go through birth, you go through death, you go through cancer scares and it's fucking, it's like a whole thing, man. It's mm. a whole thing. And holding that together as you scale is really, really hard. And that's why I think that I'm so fiendishly focused on culture because you begin mm. to realize, oh wait, we're so big at Quest. We had 3,000 employees spread across the world and they're all over the place. And if you don't have a culture that propagates the ideas, mm. they they won't all be able to have a relationship with you. Like you will scale to the point where most of your employees only know you as the guy on camera. Mm. That's a trip. Mm. And so how do you navigate that? 
Mm. How do you get the ideas to spread? And the answer is culture. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, whether it's in a company, whether it's in a family, whether it's myself, how I think about me, it's like, you have to have a set of things that you're like, these are the rules mm -hmm. that I'm gonna operate by, that mm -hmm. my family's gonna operate by, that mm -hmm. my company's gonna operate by, that I wanna see the world operate by. Mm -hmm. And yeah, rules and rules of thumb, man. Those are the, and when I say rules of thumb, I mean the beliefs that you're like, okay, when this happens, you should usually do this, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah, you can't have no rules as we've been talking about yeah. for the last two hours. Yeah, you'll yeah. really be in trouble. Yeah. Do you wanna keep going through this? Uh, if you've got more to add to that, yeah, I'm all for it because I want to make sure that people walk away knowing, okay, this is this is how I need to position myself in order to do well in this crazy time. I think, I mean, look, every time I look at it, steer by results just goes in my head. That's what I see. I think almost- Walk me through how you do that. So what metric do you use when you're trying to steer by results? Oh, that's an interesting question um, because- in our industry, you would think it's clicks, mm. but it's not just clicks, because if you just care about clicks, you get to a very dark place very quickly, especially if you're mission driven, mm. right? That takes away from the mission. So part of it is mission, part of it is financial goals, revenue growth, uh, profitability growth. Uh, part of it is the vibe at the place. I mean, that's so important, the vibe in the business, how people feel about working there. This is, to me, really, really important. And then there's also, you know, we are on the cusp of, of going like properly mainstream now. So Audio Boom, which is a company that used to host our podcast and sell ads for us, they've just uh, announced a big drop in sales. It was announced on Sky News and they were like, this platform hosts, blah, 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 and trigonometry. We interviewed a guy called Lawrence Fox recently, who's a very controversial figure in the UK. Every big media outlet in the UK wanted him and he only wanted to do it with us. Wow. And the BBC and the independent newspaper live reported from a trigonometry interview. So that's impact. Uh, we have people calling us up and go, oh, hey, I'm at the, I'm at the Conservative Party conference. Uh, a bunch of people here listen to your stuff. Hey, I'm at the Labour Party conference, the left-wing party in the UK. We, there's a bunch of people who listen to your stuff, right? Uh, we're changing We're changing the culture. We're, people are hearing what we're talking about and then they're going out into the world with those conversations in their minds. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a few different metrics there. It's interesting, Lisa and I say that laughter is a metric mm -hmm. to get to that idea of what's the vibe how are people feeling i think that's really important this is to all my entrepreneurs listening right now this is where a lot of people make a mistake they don't know what metric to look at mm. and you have to get very good at identifying the metric that matters and so yes at a high level everybody should know to pay attention to revenue and profitability um, but there are going to be more metrics than that as you get more granular on the thing. Like each thing is going to have its own metric that really matters. If you can't identify the metric that is meaningful to adjust or you're not paying attention to metrics at all, you're not going to be able to improve. So mm -hmm. I forget who said it, but what gets measured gets improved. Mm -hmm. So one, be careful what you measure. Two, make sure that you're measuring things so that you can fiendishly improve because ultimately I think that this is the beef that I have with people that have political pressures is take uh, education in America. Education in America, as far as I can see, I don't have kids, but it, it just looks like a disaster. Mm -hmm. And when I compare it to um, Jeffrey Canada, who I'm almost certain I mentioned in our last interview, uh, he's created these charter schools that are unbelievably successful. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a question of, well, by what metric, Tom, are they unbelievably successful? And so the ultimate metric to me, obviously, is um, the life satisfaction of the students over a long period of time. Uh, but in the interim, we're gonna have to measure something that is far more immediate. So graduation rates, uh, reading rates, mathematical literacy, things like that. And he just crushes mm -hmm. everybody on every metric you could think to measure. and he puts people it he does he puts these charter schools in other schools so literally same building in terrible neighborhoods mm -hmm. he doesn't hand select students it's all random so like if you had twins maybe one of them goes to the charter school and the other goes to the normal school in the same building um and so that's somebody who's just 
steering by results. Like how many of my students are graduating? How many can read? How many can do math? Um, and I'm sure they have more with like rules and politeness. I don't, those I'm guessing at, but um, knowing how you would have to get there. In fact, I, I know that they do this. They use a ton of like rules uh, that you have to like do the work. You can't um, like waste somebody else's time. Like it's all hyper regimented, hyper structured. There is a clear set of rules. People abide by the rules or they get the fuck out. Like that's the path. Mm. That's Absolutely. The path. I'm curious to ask you something. Let me hand this back to you. You, you said something about how my personality is scary. Is that were those the words? Personality is scary. No, I did not say that. Are you talking about your persona? Persona, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In that you, um, you engage with the negative comments on Twitter. You will retweet somebody, and be like, "This is fucking asinine. I can't believe you said that." You know, you're very um, erudite in the way that you speak, but that's the like message. You're like, "This is fucking stupid." Yeah. Uh, that is, yeah, I would never. It's also a it comedian thing. I used to be a comedian. So when you get heckled, your job is to deal with it, right? Yeah. So like somebody, I, I tweeted something uh, the other day and somebody replied saying, have you looked in the mirror? And I went, why is my hair off? You know, it's just like little jokes, you know, to kind of like make fun of somebody or make yeah. fun of something that they've said and to diffuse whatever it is that they've mm. said, right? Because that's, that's power. It's like, I haven't taken you seriously and I've made fun of this thing that you've said yeah. without any great, you know, one of the impacts that my friend with whom I argue a lot has had on me is we have both become much more chill about the way we communicate online. Um, Why? Because you don't need to convince them anymore? Uh, bec for me, I, I feel a sense of responsibility to, to be communicating in ways that are more effective. And sometimes going too hard is an indulgence of your Agreed. own emotion. Agreed. <clears throat> so I, I try not to indulge that too much. Uh, and also one of the things I've really noticed, and we talked about it um, at a party that you and I were at, is what you put out into the world is what comes back to you. So when I used to go hard in the paint on Twitter or whatever, like, yeah, I used to get fouled a lot. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, now, good way to say it. now I'm much more chill and it's rare for people to, to be that way with me. And also it doesn't land the same because I'm like, I'm putting good energy out there. So if you're being a dick, that's not because of me. That's because you're a dick, mm. you know? Um, yeah. But it, it was interesting that you mentioned that. You, look, you are a much, uh, I, th I think you're much less aggressive than I am in, in many ways. Yes. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, in some ways. Mm. Here's where I'm hyper aggressive. Mm -hmm. If somebody is fucking with my business, yeah. I'm very aggressive yeah. because now you're fucking with the team, yeah. you're fucking with my mission. So, <laughs> and the way that people fuck with my company would be um, not just competitors, obviously that, but more so like uh, you're doing a service for me and you're moving slowly, things like that. On that, I am not mean. Mm. I don't want people to, that's why I'm saying aggression mm. does not mean that you're being mean. Mm -hmm. Aggression is like, if you can do it this morning, don't wait until the afternoon. Mm. Whereas most people would be like, let's do it tomorrow. Mm. I'll get that, all, I just had it today. Hey, let's have another call on Thursday. Why the fuck would we do that? Right now, do it mm. right now. Mm -hmm. Share your screen, pull the thing up. And so <laughs> admittedly, I'm sure people played recordings of that. I sound exactly like I just sounded mm -hmm. just now. Mm -hmm. uh, that to me is so crazy that I'm very impatient with things like that. Um, I love it. I'm very aggressive with things that I know are going to make somebody's life better. Mm -hmm. So the example that I think would really, people would be scandalized to see what I was like in the earliest days of Quest, because Lisa and I made a decision that we were going to consider felons for um, a role at the company mm -hmm. And that meant that we ended up having felons mm -hmm. that were at the company. Now, it wasn't just like, oh, you're a felon, therefore we're gonna hire you. It wasn't like that. But it was like, hey, put the word out, whether you have felony conviction or not, we'll consider you for employment. And so we ended up having Bloods and Crips working on the same line. And we had uh, one guy, I'm sure there was more than one, uh, but we had one guy that was, he originally took the job because he needed a front for his drug money. So he needed to be able to show his parole officer, see, I have a job. Uh, but in reality, he planned to make all of his money off of selling drugs. Mm -hmm. 
And he told me that because he ended up, I was, his is a very funny story. So in the interview process, uh, because we were considering people with felony convictions, we had people lined up around the building mm -hmm. for interviews. Mm -hmm. And so I used to interview people, multiple people at a time. You know how you can just look at somebody and tell that they're sharp? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at this guy and I can tell this fucking guy's smart. He's not saying a word, mm. but he's mad dogging me the whole interview. And so I point at him, like literally, you, you have anger management problems. And he just went ghost white and he didn't say a word. And I said, uh, I want to take you for a walk. He's like, okay. So I took him for a walk and I'm like, look, dude, looking at you, I can tell you're sharp. And so we started talking about life and he was like, um, at the end of all of it, cause I was like, look, I'm going to give you a shot. Like I can tell there's something here, but you can't bring that anger onto my floor. If you fucking fight even one time, you are gone. And he was, he goes, how did you know? I said, how did I know what? He said, how did you know I have anger management problems? I came here from a court appointed anger management session. And he was like, the fact that you could tell, he was like, I, I just, I need to know how you knew. And I was like, dude, you're fucking like literally looking at me like you want to kill me. You're in the job the interview whole, yeah. staring at me like crazy. Exactly. Yeah. And so I was like, uh, that didn't really take a genius. But <laughs> honestly, it was more the willingness to be aggressive, the mm. willingness to point at somebody who you know is potentially dangerous. Because I mean, this was like people with teardrop tattoos, mm. and which I asked means they put in work for the neighborhood, mm. which they will not come out and tell you what put in work means, mm. uh, but I'm sure you can figure it out. Yep. When I know I'm helping people, mm -hmm. I am shockingly aggressive. Mm. And this is the thing that my team here has been trying to get on camera for a while, which is the side of me I only know how to bring out on stage. Mm. where on stage, I'm like, I have 60 minutes with these motherfuckers to change their life forever. And somebody's paying me a lot of money to be here. Mm. So I have this real sense of urgency. And so oftentimes when I start a talk, I'm like, hey, we've only got 60 minutes and I'm gonna change your fucking life, but you need to take notes and you need to actually do this shit. And so it puts me in this very aggressive stance, mm. which I love, mm. but it's because I know I'm going to help them. So on Twitter, I don't know. I don't have the same sense of like, mm. you're here because you really want help. I know what ideas are gonna help you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so anyway, there there is a lane in which I'm probably 10X as aggressive as you, mm -hmm. but 90% of my life, no. That makes sense. Why be aggressive? Why are you aggressive? Hmm. I don't know that I am that aggressive anymore. As I say, I've, I've kind of softened the way I do it. Do you still feel, do you still think I am? Yeah. Yeah. Defiant, maybe not. I never would have categorized you as defiant. So the thing that you're feeling you may have changed is probably that. Mm. But um, for instance, you, you will bring people on the show mm -hmm. that you know are going to... Um, they have a, a belief that's not going to make them look good. Yeah. I have a real hard time dragging people into those waters because I'm like, ah, I don't want to see this person do that to themselves, which is bad, by the way, and I'm trying to change. This is a weakness in my personality. Mm. Uh, you have no problem with that. My job is to facilitate political discussion because what we're talking about is how to run our society. Correct. And my job is to bring people on and do one thing and one thing only which is to show the world what that person truly thinks. That is my only job. And I am meticulous and rigorous in pursuing that goal. Yep. And that means when you come on my show, my job is to keep asking you questions until what you're saying is revealed truly in its mm. boiled down form to the world. I don't actually ever bring people on to make them look bad. I and didn't say that. I know you didn't say that. But some people think that because, for example, last year we were here, we had Sam Harris on mm. the show and we asked him about Donald Trump and he said some things that send the world crazy um, and that I didn't agree with. But I and people would come up to me and Francis after that for, for still they doing like, oh, you got Sam Harris, didn't you? And I'm right. like, no, 
I didn't get Sam Harris. I didn't want to get Sam Harris. I like Sam. I respect Sam, even though I really strongly disagree with what he said. My job as the interviewer is to show the world what this person thinks about this issue about which they want to speak. Mm. I don't ever take people to a place they don't want to go. I don't ever ask people questions about things they've asked me not to talk about. Right. But my job is to find out exactly what you think and to show the world that. So our mission is somewhat different. Your mission is help people uh, share good ideas about how they should be, etc. Right. That's not my mission. My mission is to show people what somebody thinks. Mm. Um, and I regret that the, sometimes the impact of that is that our guests look bad. And the first thing I did when Sa that thing happened with Sam, the number one thing Francis and I did is reach out to Sam and say, look, we're really sorry that this is how this has gone down. It wasn't our intention. We were not the ones who put a clip out that makes you look extra bad. None of that is to do with us. We're grateful you came on the show. We appreciate your time. You're an absolute gentleman. Mm. However, when you interview people in, in, you know, it's called trigonometry for a reason. When you interview right. people about contentious subjects, uh, you know, the world is going to take a, a view on what, on what they say. And that is the nature of cultural and political debate. Yeah, facts. Number one, the other thing about aggression is, I, you know, you mentioned me being good at debating. I mean, debating is about getting to the very root cause of what you're saying, right? In order to defeat an idea that you're advancing, I have to crystallize it down and go, that's what this person is saying. Here's why it's wrong, mm. right? And flip it. That sometimes requires a kind of a tenacity and an aggression to it. Um, and plus, it's more entertaining that way. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Yeah, I mean, like if you're watching two boxers fight, you don't want them to go. Uh, uh, you right. know, you want to see them going for it. Speaking of two boxers fighting, you had Sam and Eric Weinstein on the show. <sighs> mm. um, I mean, this I will air after your episode. Okay. So, uh, how did that go? Those two, I respect ferociously. Mm -hmm. I've gotten reasonably close to Eric. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know Sam as well, but had Sam on the show recently. Uh, and just every time I'm with him, even though, again, there are things that he and I don't agree on, mm. um, but I really respect Sam. And I, I worry that the world has a, some portion of the world, a very terrifyingly large portion of the world has sort of balled him up and thrown him away as somebody who can help them think through very hard problems. Mm -hmm. I would say he's still one of the first people I reach for. That doesn't mean that I agree with everything that he mm -hmm. says, but it does mean that I, I want to hear what he's got to say. Mm -hmm. um, how did that conversation go? It was awesome. Uh, we talked about Israel and Palestine for about two hours. Uh, and then we did a... Did they have uh, different yes, views on it? Interesting. They did. Interesting. They did. Yeah. And one of the things that we were keen on is that while, look, from a content creation perspective, disagreement is always helpful. Yeah. That isn't, we didn't set it up as a debate. Help navigate it well. Yeah. We didn't set it up as a debate. We didn't market it as a debate. So that's not how it's presented. Mm -hmm. And there was disagreement. And there were points at which I had to go, okay, stop. We're doing it like this now. Um, but it was very, very interesting conversation, very productive. I feel like we're impacted a lot. And then we, as you know, we do a section for our local supporters, mm -hmm. which goes behind a paywall. Uh, and in that section, we talked a little bit about the last interview, Sam's falling out with Brett, who is Eric's brother. Mm -hmm. There was a whole, you know, the IDW, the intellectual dark web and all of the stuff that comes out of that. So there was a whole interesting conversation about, you know, whether Israel would have happened if Trump had been in power. Whoa, you, you know, I want to hear that oh, part. Oh, of course you do. Everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you have to subscribe to our locals. Um, so a lot of cool stuff happened. Mm. A lot of it was, it was a great conversation. Two brilliant minds. What made you want to bring them together? Why didn't you ball up <laughs> Sam like so many other people and say, ah, Trump derangement syndrome, not worth listening to. His brain is broken. The number of people that have said that Trump broke Sam's brain. I'm, I think I'm able to compartmentalize things uh, about people. I mean, I, I, I have a family, dad, mum, three younger sisters, who I love, all of them. They all have different opinions about stuff. They all don't agree with each other. They don't agree with me on lots of stuff. But that doesn't mean that, for example, I have been outspoken on my view of what's happening in Ukraine. 
in, in, in my vehement support for Ukraine's right to defend itself, etc. My dad takes the completely opposite view. Mm. And to me, it's an emotive issue. And to him, it's an emotive issue. But my dad is one of the smartest, most erudite human beings that I've ever been around. So am I going to throw that out because Russia broke his brain? Well, that would be insane, right? We have to, I mean, part of what we're doing here and this medium being the message is you and I, you know, earlier, earlier today, I went, I love you, I respect you, I learned from you, blah, blah, blah. I have no fucking idea what you're talking about. That is the model on which we have to operate. And I respect Sam. I think he was very courageous, raising some really controversial issues back in the day. He's one of the first people that uh, brought people's attention to woke ideology being a, a big problem as a left-wing liberal mm. guy. Uh, he has a lot of credit in the bank with me. A lot of credit in the bank. Now, you know, there are some people who have gone completely off the rails and you're going, well, there's not much that we can connect around. I don't feel that with Sam at all. Now, do I agree with what he said about Trump? No. Do I agree with some of the COVID stuff that he said at point? No. I think his, by the way, his take on it that he put out on his podcast recently was gave some nuance to the thing, which is kind of like I had certain opinions in different stages that evolved over time, but I got nailed for having those opinions at a different time, essentially, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I don't throw people away unless like they've really, really, really gone completely off the deep end in a direction I don't like. And I also thought, I hate people, I hate to see people ganging up on people. I hate to see people bullying people. I hate people who, um, who like to pile on people in a really abusive and horrible way. And I didn't, I thought what Sam said was wrong, but I thought he was badly treated. Mm. Um, and interestingly, one of the final things he says in that second section of the interview on locals is the reason I'm back here with you guys is you behaved in a highly ethical way around that situation. And for us, the, the reason we did that, it was not strategic. It was because we believe in behaving in an ethical way and having integrity. So, um, yeah, I mean, it never occurred to us that we wouldn't speak to Sam or, you know, Sam is canceled now. We don't really think like that. Yeah. No, I love that. I think that that's really important. And I, I have been saying for a long time now um, that I don't understand why people are looking for reasons to ignore other people, mm. to not listen to them, to not hear them out. I'm looking for reasons to learn from somebody. I'm going to guess that that has to do with I'm very confident in my ability to parse through difficult ideas. It mm -hmm. takes me time and I wish I was faster. And that's why I would defer to you in a debate, not mm -hmm. myself. Like if you leave me alone with the ideas long enough, mm -hmm. I feel that I'll get somewhere fruitful. Mm -hmm. um, but it it's going to take me time. And uh, so I'm very confident in my ability to say you can have a really smart person tell me something really fucking stupid mm. and i'm gonna run it through my filter of is this usable mm. will is this more or less likely to to accurately predict the outcome of my behaviors mm -hmm. if less likely i will reject if more likely i will at least try it out and see what happens um, so i have a feeling that people get lost in the sophisticated ideas the they just there's so much coming at them so much velocity of information that they just need a reason to reject mm -hmm. people to shut them down uh, and then feeling righteous. I'm right, he's wrong. And that makes me feel smart because he, I used to think he was so much smarter than me and now I know he's dumb. I saw so many comments like that. I used to think Sam was smart. Now I know that he's dumb. And it's like, I worry that that's them patting themselves on the back. Oh, I'm not as dumb as I thought I was. I'm mm. smarter than Sam Harris. Um, super dangerous. Also, I'll be interested. So I'm gonna give you my take on what's really going on with Sam. That's dangerous. You just talked to him. So you may have a way better idea. But I put a, a tweet thread out, and this was one of the tweet threads that made me realize getting into like quote unquote political think I'm just never gonna do. Mm -hmm. It's so boring to me. Like I tried to really give people what I thought was a super thoughtful, useful breakdown that if you understand his way of thinking that you still don't have to agree with it, but understand how he's come to it. Because then, one, you can think through these things better in the future. And anyway, people were just like, no, Trump broke his brain. It's like, Jesus Christ. like at least address the argument. So this is my interpretation mm -hmm. of Sam. Mm -hmm. Sam Sam has a tripwire in his mind that says, if this is an existential threat, mm -hmm. then there is nothing that I won't do to stop the existential threat from coming through as long as it's not another existential threat. And 
so it's like if you believe that that Trump could end humanity, then everything he says makes sense. Mm -hmm. But everybody wants to say that 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 wasn't the context of his comment, that they were saying that he was saying it as if that's what he thought we should have done. So everyone's like, yeah, if the thing was 100 times more lethal, then yeah, it would make sense. Yes, mother, th that's his fucking point, mm -hmm. is that if this thing is an existential threat, then we should act in this way. Mm -hmm. He believes Trump is an existential threat. And so my point is, yo, what do we do when we can't agree on when we're actually under that level of threat or not? That is a terrifying question. Mm -hmm. That is where people need to figure out, yeah, how do we? What's the metric by which you judge success? What's the metric by which we judge something where we can't see into the future um, that this actually is an existential threat? How do we navigate that? Because mm -hmm. this is going to happen again, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's where I was like, yeah, I, I think the problem with Sam's argument is Trump isn't an existential mm -hmm. threat. Not existential. It's interesting because you and I have come to the exact same conclusion, which is I think the reason Sam felt the way he did about, spoke the way he did about Trump and COVID to the extent that he did, is that he assesses the threat of those two things or did assess them in a completely different way to most people. The problem with that is that, you know, if I ran in here and said, well, if you don't move that cup, we're all going to die and then you refused and I shot you, yeah. that kind of be a, that'd be a pretty big fucking problem. Yes. Right. So uh, I think a lot of people felt that he was misassessing the threat. And as a result, asking or proper, you know, suggesting things that were inappropriate to suggest in that situation, uh, which is my view. I also, to steel man the other argument against Sam, I don't necessarily share it, well, I don't know. Let me say it first, and then I'll I'll think about whether I share or not. Is that there is a certain kind of person who is w extraordinarily well educated, well read, sophisticated, smart, refined, um, you know, aware of the complexity of the world, who just finds Donald Trump personally obnoxious. And the, that obnoxiousness bleeds through into the factual analysis of Trump's behavior, which is where the threat misassessment comes from, some people might argue. So it's not a logical reaction to the actual threat that Trump poses. It's a reaction to his boorishness and to his, um, I was, this kind of like the way he speaks, you know, he's not sophisticated. He's... He's not, he doesn't sound educated. And I, I don't know whether he is or not. Uh, I don't think Trump is stupid at all, but, but that is the sort of thing that people like to say. And, you know, California is a place there are a lot of people who think like that. Um, so I think that that's why a lot of people react to Trump the way they do. And as we talked about earlier, I think his he's prepared to say the ugly truth in a way that makes it even uglier. Well said. And people don't like that. Um, however, I do think, as I said earlier, that given a beautiful lie and an ugly truth that is made even uglier, if that is what's on the ballot, I'm going with the truth and I don't give a shit how ugly it sounds, mm. you know. Uh, and that is not a position that I would have held in 2016. I just think the nature of the problems we're now facing is so much greater than it was back then. And I warned about this. I said to people, if you allow this woke ideology to get out of control, you're going to get people who are going to come along and go, look at this, look what they created. And the vast majority of most normal people are going to go, okay, I'm with you. Because at least you're willing to be honest. At least you're willing to try and deal with the problems that that have been created. Uh, I think there's going to be a backlash against what has happened now. I've been, I, and this is what I was saying at the time. I was like, I'm not against wokeness because I'm on the right. I'm against wokeness because it's going to cause a right wing backlash, and it's a bad idea in and of itself too. Um, so I think in in that respect, 
that is, I think, where the Sam situation came from. Um, and like I said, I didn't agree with him, but I think he has lots of other valuable things to say. And by the way, in the conversation that we had with Eric, he brought up a thing that people aren't talking about. Maybe it's true or maybe not. People can make their own judgment about it. But he was like, look, Israel-Palestine is not about Palestine. It's about something else. Tell me more. It's about jihad. Hmm. These people are not upset because they care about oppressed Palestinians. They are jihadis who see the West and Israel as the enemy to be wiped out. And that is what motivates them. And therefore, we have to calibrate our response to that. That is not a point of view that you hear a lot, but it is a point of view that I think is valid. And uh, jihadi is somebody who believes they're fighting God's war. Yes. God wants this enemy wiped out. Yes. You are doing God's work if you go do that. And martyrdom in the service of jihad is the greatest achievement you can have. Mm. Therefore, to take your own life and give it for that is the greatest good. The loss of civilian life is irrelevant because if... Uh, if if a good Muslim dies in the service of jihad, he goes straight to paradise. Mm. And if you're not a good Muslim or if you're not a Muslim, your life doesn't matter because you're an infidel. Uh, that changes the calculus and the game theory of everything immediately. And that's a valuable perspective, whether it's, you know, whether you personally think it's correct or not. I think it's a valuable dimension to this conversation mm. that has to be taken into account. And Sam is somebody who provides an immense level of clarity and has done from an early point in this conversation um, about that issue, which is super important, I think. Yeah, he recently released a podcast about, uh, I think it's like the the problem with moral equivalency or something mm, like that, mm. last couple of days. Yeah, he is, uh, he is a very clear thinker. Whether you agree or disagree, he gives you the argument so clearly, so concisely, you can decide for yourself whether you think he's right or wrong. Mm. He certainly isn't uh, wishy-washy or um, trying to use linguistic tricks. Like he is, this is what I think, this is why I think it. That's one of the reasons that I, um, there are precious few public thinkers that are so clear in their thinking, Thomas Sowell being mm. another one, um, Sam Harris being one where they, they can just lay out their arguments like step by step so mm -hmm. that you can piece it back together. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really pretty extraordinary. And that brings up a point that Eric made in that second section of the interview on locals, which is that he, he when we were talking about, is there a way to kind of repair the intellectual dark web, which mm -hmm. fell apart? You know, a lot of people would argue just cause there were too many male egos, you know, fighting it out, duking it out. Um, but he was like, Eric said something which I think was beautiful, and I can't remember the example he used. It was a very beautiful point and beautifully made, which was about the fact that this doesn't belong to us. This group of people who, who are prepared to think out loud in public, it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to other people. And we can't let internal bullshit get in the way of that service to others. And I thought that was a very important message. And for Sam and Eric to sit in the same room and, and for us to talk about that, mm. I was very proud of the fact that, you know, and who knows, my hope is that that's the beginning of a, of a beautiful rekindling of friendships and all of that. It, it might not be. And the way the world's going probably isn't going to be. But I would love for that to be the case. I would love for people who used to be friends to become friends again. I would love for people who used to hash out really, really difficult ideas in the public eye, which is so hard to do in the mm. modern world. So hard, so, so hard, you know, and we pride ourselves on talking about difficult issues openly, but the number of times we finish a conversation now and we go, okay, well, here's what I would say if it wasn't on camera, you know, because people are terrified to speak openly in public. And it's dangerous. It genuinely is dangerous because a lot of people feel like it's one slip and you're done. One slip and you are Sam Harris, essentially, right? I, I really, really believe that we move forward as a society when we're able to have really difficult conversations with really smart people without, without that, you know, uh, with good intentions and good faith. Uh, it's really important. It's really important. So I hope that, you know, who knows, but I really hope that happens. I love it. We'll leave it there.
Konstantin Kissin, thank you so much. Where can people follow you? Uh, head to our YouTube channel, Trigonometry. There it is. Nice and easy. All right, everybody, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace. To learn more about these complex topics, check out this episode with the one and only Jordan Peterson. Man, I am beside myself with excitement to have you on.